We're going to call to order the Historic District Commission meeting for February 9th. Um, the first order of business tonight is to again nominate an interim chair to uh, administer and run the meeting. Uh, given Chairman Wyckoff is uh, on the Zoom call but in Florida and the Vice Chair, I believe, um, Reagan Rudig is at home tonight. So do we have a nomination for I'd like to nominate Margot for interim chair. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody Aye. opposed? Reagan, I assume is good too? Aye. Okay, so I don't, I'll get you the gavel if I can find it. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, great, thank you very much. I'll just start with an introduction of the members of the commission, starting with our two remote members. If they could introduce themselves and say whether they're alone or have company in their homes. John? Go ahead, John. Oh, okay. I'm John Wyckoff. I'm uh, down in St. Petersburg, Florida. My wife is in this apartment, but um, we are attempting to be separate. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is Reagan Rudig. I am um, unfortunately at home um, in my home office alone in this room. And to my left, we have Karen Buffard. Good evening. David Adams. Good evening. Rich Blaylock from our city council. Good evening. Nick Cracknell, our principal planner. Good evening. Martin Ryan. Evening. Dan Brown. Good evening. And Heinz Hawk Schubert. Good evening. And I'm Margot Doring. Okay, I will read our legal language. The board's actions in these matters has been deemed to be quasi-judicial in nature. If any person believes any member of the board has a conflict of interest, that issue should be raised at this point, or will it be deemed waived? Anyone wish to raise any issues? Thank you, very good. Um, with regard to the matters in front of us, is there anybody on the commission that needs to recuse themselves? Nope, okay, very good. We'll start then with the administrative approvals. Nick, if you could lead us through. Thank you. There are four administrative approvals for tonight's meeting. Three of them are on Market Street. Uh, they're very similar, Unit 7, 6L, and 12L. Uh, the first three on the administrative approval agenda and uh, basically would probably, I think I'm going to group them. They're all the same applicant other than the unit owner. The, the contractor that's replacing windows and doors in those units has prepared all three applications. Uh, unit 7 is to replace three patio doors. Uh, these are Anderson doors. Uh, unit 6L is five replacement windows. I think double hungs in the bathroom and the kitchen. These are the Anderson Fibrix windows, the fiberglass clad, and they have casement windows in the proposed for the bedroom, probably for egress reasons. And then unit uh, 12L L is five windows and a door similar to the other two with casement windows in the bedroom and all the other windows are double hung. The only thing I, that jumped out at me and there could be more is that we need a stipulation for half screens for the windows. But did anybody see any, there's a lot of paperwork in there from the vendor and I apologize for that. The hmm. applicant submitted it, it gets printed out and forwarded <clears> to you guys. <throat> any questions or comments on that? There are obviously the windows they're replacing are fairly new replace there it's a new building new ish on nobles island okay. any any questions or comments any issues no no okay all right Next. so let's remember the half screen yep. for those and then the last one is 75 gate street and this is very straightforward i think but i i brought it here because i i wanted to make sure the replacement door was appropriate for the structure the door that's in there appeared to my eyes not to be, as well as the owner and the contractor. It's a fiberglass door with some odd glazing pattern from the 80s um, or 90s, and they would like to replace it with sort of that craftsman door, which I can pull up here. It's wood. It seems appropriate, but again, this is the existing door on 75 gates. It's a side door, fiberglass. This is the replacement door, which is presumably dug fir, I would guess. So, Nick, yes, sir. It, that's not the front door, right? No, it's the oh, side okay. door. Sorry, yeah, I was going to say I go talking. by that a lot and didn't recognize it. Side door. Yep. Uh, yep. So, is that an appropriate door for that house? Oh I yeah. Thought so, but Gate Street. 
Okay, so that's all four of them uh, with a stipulation on, I guess, number two and three for a half screen because the patio doors are number one. Well, motion to approve as presented with the stipulation of a half screen for the for those windows, the double hung windows cited. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? And I'll take a roll call vote starting with John. Uh, yes. Reagan. Yes. David. Yes. Rich. Yes. Martin. Approved. Dan. Yes. Thank you. All right, we will move on to public hearings, old business, petition of the National Society of Colonial Dames, owner for property located at Zero Market Street, the Ore House, wherein permission is requested to allow the replacement of rooftop mechanical equipment and renovations to an existing structure as per plans on file in the planning department, said property is shown on assessor map 118 as lot five and lies within the character district four, downtown overlay, and civic and historic districts. Who is here to present tonight? Um, is Carla here or? Ray, is, is somebody gonna present this? Okay. <clears throat> and for the audience, just note the material that came in for this is available on the website but never made it into the packet in time to go out Friday. So what's on the screen does not include your fencing uh, amendment, but every every board member has that in front of them, and I believe it's on the web page. Okay. 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 So you this is last week's. This image. is last week's up yes. on the. So okay. You can, right. But you have this packet. Sorry. Everybody has that, right? Do you, did you see that? Yes. I'm speaking too soon, perhaps. Yeah. Is there a fence material? I'm, I'm, uh, it, there there's is a packet. A I, I'm not sure what time this came in on Friday, but there's a supplemental February second package that deals with the screen and it's essentially not to speak for you but it's a replacement in kind of the existing fence I believe with mahogany instead of maybe PT or whatever was originally used and as discussed it's wrapped uh, you know 40 percent of the way or 33 percent of the way back along the side where there's currently no fence as discussed at the last does anybody is this unfamiliar to all of you yeah we we have it on our tablet yeah. oh so it's familiar mm -hmm. yep. yep but uh, let's let's start with an introduction yeah with all due respect yeah if uh, sorry running in here uh david Calkins, back channel consulting here on behalf of the or house and the applicant thank you um so we were here last week but if you don't mind we've made some revisions let's just start at the beginning so we can go through and make sure we're all uh clear as to what is proposed so on section 2.0 uh, at the heart of this application is really we've proposed swapping out removing two of the roof mounted hoods and replacing it with two new ones from there uh, we have discovered a few things if you're looking at 2.0 that graphic right there uh, sorry, no, I'm gonna go f see if I can find it you keep talking okay, okay. 2.0 in your packet uh, you'll see some red X's drawn through. So the two hoods are A and B, which are noted. The original tent was to remove those, install two new ones. Since then, we found some additional vents that are no longer in service, so the intent is to now remove those. It's actually a total of eight penetrations uh, in all, and that's really depicted nicely on 3.0. You have uh, two old gas vents. One's a candy cane. These are four-inch lines. The two hoods, as we uh, originally set out, another small uh, exhaust, and then two older um, vents that have been capped off, which are closer to the building side. And then we have the side scoop on the side of the building next to the stair. So eight in total will be removed, and then two new ones will be going back in to replace A and B. Now, uh, Last week, we had discussed the height and the size massing of the two new ones in relation to the ones that are going in. And on 2.0 below the graphic, you will see the existing height of A, which is the exhaust, is 42 inches high, 44 inches wide. That's the mushroom one uh, right there on 3.0, the one closer to the water. 42 inches high, 44 inches wide. That has a 10-inch curb. Now that one correlates with 
on 4.0 uh, EF1, which is 45.13 inches tall, including the curb. So, you know, we're at a delta of just over three inches um, and in width, it's a little bit, it's actually skinnier than the one that's there. Uh, B, the fresh air intake is 33 inches high, 33 inches wide. We are proposing uh, moving to GV1, which is 23 inches wide and has a 12 inch curb. So we're, we're 35. So I guess we're negotiable, I guess, in my uh, humble opinion, as far as size of the uh, new mechanicals. To clarify something that came up last week, uh, we're removing the membrane roof for a few reasons. One is we're now eliminating extra penetrations through it. It's starting to look like Swiss cheese here by the time we move things. So a new membrane roof is in order. In doing that, we're adding structure. We're not altering the elevation up or down of the roof. We're simply sistering joists, ceiling joists that are there. We're heading off the new penetrations to allow for the new roof, uh, rooftop mechanical, and we're uh, blocking in the old ones. So the structure is simply there to fill in the roof system, uh, provide some additional support for the new air makeup unit, which is mounted inside the building. Moving on to graphic 3.0, which you have up. Now, as of the last meeting, we took your comments and the applicant took your uh, comments and they have decided to replace the fence in kind. And what I mean by that is the height of the fence will not change, the spacing between the pickets, the size of the pickets, uh, the top rail, bottom rail will not change. The only thing is the species in which it's built. It will no longer be pressure treated. It will be mahogany and it will be left natural no painting, no coating. Uh, in uh, a mistake on our behalf that was brought to our attention is on 4.1, we show the uh, basically a, a very simplistic drawing of how the fence will look. And you'll see the roof membrane uh, noted, yes, that is actually coming up where uh, Nick is, is notifying. That is just a mistake on our behalf. Um, but it does not change. The only thing that changes in elevation there is actually the granite curb goes from the treehouse toys, goes from about flush with the sidewalk down to, I don't have my notes, I believe it's <coughs> 12, inches, 12 inches, 14 inches, yeah. somewhere in there. Um, also, just to be clear, just below the fence, you'll see a three course line of what looks like um, slats. It's not really a. Uh, um, a V-match or anything like that. It's, it's basically pressure treated uh, one by stock that is uh, stacked. That will also be replaced with mahogany just so that that look continues up. Elevations will not change, simply a material replacement there. Now the other improvement that we are proposing uh, in addition to replacing the front fence in kind is turning the fence down the uh, sidewalk, or sorry, down the stair. Now, this is, it's 18 feet is what we're proposing, and it's a very deliberate reason that it's 18 feet. From all angles on market, well, from most angles, vantage points on Market Street, as you walk through, 18 feet sufficiently shades the new mechanicals that we're proposing, but does not impact any views of the water that are not otherwise impacted currently by the building or the house behind uh, the building. And let me reference the building. That is, I don't know the street, but it's, or the number, it's the building that the tree house is in, the ore house restaurant, not the single story building. So on 3.1, we've tried to uh, illustrate from different vantage points why the 18 foot mark is important. Starting in the upper uh, left corner, the yellow outline space, 18 feet, does not go beyond the Treehouse Toys building. Moving across the top to the right, again, 18 feet just goes beyond uh, the building but into the small uh, house that is behind on Siri Street. And that is continued, as you see in the graphic, lower uh, bottom left and then on the bottom right. So. We've tried to accomplish a few things here. We've tried to really 
find that marriage of screening the mechanicals as uh, we've heard the board wants and also um, preserving what the dames uh, really want to see and what's in their mission and, and that is to respect the views that are down there. So we hope that you feel um, what we're proposing is appropriate and I think if there's any questions I'm, I'm happy to answer them now. Questions? Yes, Dan. Yes, originally last week you were also uh, replacing one of the mechanicals running along the side, along the wall. Uh, removing, sir. We'll be removing that. Okay, just that. removing that. Correct, and uh, that'll be replaced with water struck brick, and we'll take a look at the mortar to make sure that's Great. appropriate. Yes, Karen. The side vent, uh, I know you said that it was going to be removed and it last week I think did have an X it doesn't this week but that is going right it that is going okay okay other questions John or Reagan yes rich no I have no problem okay. with thank this you John application rich oh, I'm I'm fine with it I, I wish that I we could see a more appropriate fence style go up but in uh the short time span I know that they're looking for this um this is this is fine thank you Rich um thank you um so I understand that side of the building is 37 feet four inches um that new unit would be 10 feet from the series street side going up um 10 feet from Siri Street towards Market Street. And then the fence would be 18 feet going from Market Street down. Correct. Um, so it wouldn't be like, if you're looking directly parallel, it would be a little bit past where the fence, right? Correct, yeah. If you are shoulder with the unit on the stairs, <clears throat> uh, it, it would come out beyond the fence a right, little bit. Right, but at that point, you're not looking at the water, you're looking at the building. And to be honest with you, Rich, I don't know what the elevation is at that point of the building in relation to the step that you're on, but, right. uh, you yeah. know, there's some tall people in the city too, so. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I'd just like to say, um, I think it is important to protect the water views and also the view from the water of the Moffitt Lad House. Um, I know that's a very popular, I actually have that image on my wall at my home. And um, if that fence we got too high, then it would actually block the view of the home from the river. Um, but I think it's important to um, approve, you know, approve this and uh, help out your house. I know how construction projects can be difficult with a seasonal business, and um, if you experience delays and other things that can really cause problems. So, thank you. Um, well, I excuse me. Yes, uh, Martin, go ahead. Okay. Um, I know you want to summarize. No, um, I don't find this fence uh, configuration appropriate for the historic district. To me, this looks like more of a pressure treated deck that you would find in a typical residential suburban neighborhood. I would ask that it be something, uh, you know, we can, you can come back with a, um, you know, I'm proposing that maybe you could come back for an administrative approval, but I would ask for something more traditional. Um, I'm not worried about the views. Uh, I, you know, the Moffat Lad House is on a hill across the street. And I, the only views you're blocking for them are the views of these units. Um, so to me, this, this configuration with the slanted top, the one by the, the two by two pickets with the bevel top is totally inappropriate for the, this district. Um, I can live with the 18 foot side uh, screening with an appropriate fence. And I would ask that uh, when you do replace the, the mem membrane roofing, you'd want to put a finished coping uh, and not have it the way it looks now with just a slight, uh, you know, return bar. Uh, right now, that looks very unfinished. I would hope that you would put a coping on that to, for an appropriate finish of that edge. Yeah, to eliminate the steel belting. Is that what Please. you're referring to? And if I may, there's one other very important point that uh, Rich sort of uh, spoke to. What we're proposing on that side is that the fence would in fact plane with the roof. We're not looking to have it go level per se and then step down. It would be in plane with the roof. 
again, to preserve the fact that as that fence goes down towards Siri Street, if we were to keep that level, that would start stepping up higher and impacting views. So the, you know, we're proposing to keep it in plane with the roof. Yeah. And naturally, your pickets would be vertical. Cor yeah, correct. Yeah. So um, I, I think I had some of the same concern that Rich raised, that this unit is moving so much closer to Siri Street. And yes, as you walk down the stairs, your, your eye level goes down and you're not going to see it. But my concern is, um, Nick, if you could pull up 3.1, the top right hand uh, image, if you could zoom in on that. If you're walking past this garden, that fence is not going to hide that unit. And I, I don't see how a fence that is going toward the water is going to block a view. Its, it's profile is going to be about this big. Um, but we, we have been pushing other applicants very hard in the residential area and other areas to really screen very well these mechanicals. And we're talking about much smaller condensers for mini splits. And we're asking questions like, can you see this from the upstairs window? You know, is this, is this something that the neighbors in the back can view? This is the public way. Um, walking along this beautiful <coughs> garden and, and looking across the garden and seeing a, a big, huge fan because you're not moving that, bringing that fence down any further than 18 feet doesn't make sense to me. Any other comments, David? Yes, M Madam Chairman. Um, uh, Martin mentioned, uh, and I'd like to actually enter into a bit of a dialogue with Martin here, uh, that, that you'd mentioned the, the uh, we'll just say the modern nature of the, the proposed replacement fence. Um, it, it's certainly, it's, to me, it also seems separated quite a bit from our historic past. And, and it is, in a sense, the viewscape of the Moffat Lad and the Colonial Dames, which makes you wonder. Um, I wasn't a fan of this. Um, I was really viewing it as, as a time to upgrade the fence because it looked shabby. I, I, and I hadn't really been thinking seriously about what kind of fence there. Certainly, putting a Chinese Chippendale period fence like this in front of the mansion house itself, I think is in, inappropriate for disguising a roof and roof vents. But I wonder if the, the solid uh, frame and panel fence that they have at the Moffat Lab on the other side, their side lot, is that something that you would think would be more appropriate? Far more appropriate than what's here being uh, proposed. And do you think if, if we were to suggest that in a, with a certainty <laughs> to the uh, applicant, uh, do you think that that's the kind of m model that you, they should be using for the fence, the wing fence, this 18-foot section of fence also? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. If, if I, I may. A, I'd, I'm just going to ask Nick to make a, a technical question. Um, is, is the applicant required, if they're replacing something that currently exists, are they required to change the style if we ask them to? Or if they're replacing in kind, they are allowed to keep this? That, that's not easy to answer because this application is primarily a mechanical replacement project, mm. not a replacement in kind. That happens to be what the proposal is for the, for the screening material. Obviously, the fence getting longer and turning is not a replacement in kind. Okay. So I, I'd have a hard time signing off on something, even, even replacing what's there in kind given the nature of this application. I think, you know, you're going to have to decide collectively what type of screen works, how tall it is, and certainly whoever mentioned it, probably Martin, if there isn't agreement tonight on the fence, then you could certainly approve this application so they can move forward with the mechanicals with a condition that the screening return for administrative approval with some of the ideas that have been floated mm -hmm. 
be considered, and that's an option. Otherwise, you vote on what's here, and it could prevent the mechanicals from moving forward if there's a problem. And I'd, I'd like to just express one concern that went into the design of this. Again, the 18-foot uh, piece was very deliberate, and I do understand your point. The other vantage point that we didn't do a great job of illustrating would be coming back down Siri Street and potentially having a, a solid fence out to the roof edge of the Orr House restaurant, sort of visually protruding mm -hmm. out. And so that's why we also thought it would be appropriate to step that back. I mean, to mask or shade the mechanicals in its entirety <clears throat> becomes a slippery slope with where, where do we stop? Because we can make the argument that it's also viewable from Siri Street. So now we're boxing this thing in and now we're creating a, a snow catch and other issues. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I don't respect uh, the intent here. Um, also, the, the matter of the fence, again, uh, the fence visually does break up the line. It may not break it up as you would love and, and would be the, as I say, good, better, best scenario. It does visually break that up. It does achieve what the, the intent of the fence is. I guess we're now debating on to what level uh, does it need to break up the visual impairment, so. Okay. So um, may I make the following suggestion? Absolutely. Um, I don't hear anybody having any issue with you removing eight old mechanicals from the top <laughs> of this building and replacing it with the uh, units that you have suggested. So um, I think that that's probably something we could move forward on. And then with regard to the fencing, um, have you come back, as Martin suggested, with an administrative approval where you would lay out in more detail with better sketches and so on the design of the fences? Um, given your point with regard to the view from Siri Street, may I suggest that you um, give us a rendering that is the 18-foot fence and then bring it just far enough, because I know that new mechanical is 10 feet back from Siri Street. Bring, bring the fence down just enough, but no more than you know 10 feet from the edge. Um, and let's take a look at different views of that. Okay. Um, I think that that will serve you better, and it'll serve the commission better in terms of getting a good result. Mm -hmm. Is that acceptable? It is, and just in the interest of being absolutely clear, because the uh, the arrangement uh, of the application is is complicated, it is unacceptable, or uh, yeah, I guess unacceptable is the right term to the board to move forward with the fence design as proposed. What I'm concerned with is if we moved forward with the mechanicals, and that was not. Um, uh, acceptable to the applicant that we we would be at a, a stalling point so i just want to make sure very clear that the board is not happy with the fence design that cannot move forward tonight is that what i'm hearing i think that's what i'm hearing yes okay margo may i say a word please yes go ahead john <clears throat> um one thing we have found in the past is that views depend on where you're standing and so if one were to march off into the flower garden, squishing the various flowers and stand there, they might see lots of things on that roof, including the um, compressors that are on the side of the toy store uh, building. So um, I'm, I'm very happy to see this 18 feet, um, which I feel walking <clears throat> up the sidewalk um, certainly does a good job. But um, if the board feels, the majority of the board feels that's not right, then um, you know, that's how we'll vote. As, as for changing the design of the fence, um, I would have to disagree with Nick in the fact uh, that they are replacing in kind a wooden fence with wood. They can use the same design. Um, they could just set that fence aside all shabby looking and put it back up again. Um, those are my comments. I'm just hoping that we can get past this um, very minor 
proposal. Thank you. Any further comments? And somebody from the public is. Thank you. Okay, public comment, please. Or you are from, you represent the applicant as well? I represent the Colonial Dames. Okay, then why don't we that have you a speak? a little bit awkward. Okay, so. Uh, the gentleman represents, Mr. Calkins represents the Colonial, has the authority of the Colonial Dames to act on our behalf with respect to the application, which is submitted by 55 Sierra Street, LLC. I don't speak for 55 LL, Sierra Street, LLC. I speak for the Colonial Dames. Okay. So. Based on what I've heard here tonight, I think it's very important to just clarify a, a couple of things to make sure that we're all on the same page because um, from our perspective, we've been working very hard to accommodate the applicant to help him move ahead with this application and all this work that, he, that he's attempting to do to the building. And uh, we feel to a certain extent that there's been a level of miscommunication that has created uh, some issues for us. So. The letter for January 14th, you've all seen. We talked about it a little bit last week. We were here last week to discuss the application. We heard concerns about the fence. Uh, we were given a, the proposed uh, stuff you saw uh, focusing ourselves on page 4.1. Uh, we received that late Friday afternoon. Uh, the dames, uh, again, to do our absolute best to accommodate 55 Sierra Street LLC met on Tuesday morning to discuss the fence. Uh, we noticed some issues with the drawing, which, which has been alluded to, brought, those, brought that to the attention of, um, of the uh, of 55 Sierra Street's attorney, sent a letter to Mr. Cracknell this morning that outlines all that. So this has come together pretty quickly. And the Dames is an organization. It's not one person who makes these decisions. These decisions have to be made collectively. And that's not always easy. It's not like uh, entities of the city of Portsmouth, uh, there is discussion that has to happen and, and, uh, and uh, debate. And so we did our absolute best to do that. Uh, the terms of what the dames are supporting in terms of the replacement of the fence is outlined in the letter uh, of today's date uh, that, I, that uh, I sent in this morning. Uh, we didn't even find out until this morning that, that there was gonna be a hearing on this issue today. Uh, I, so, that's why things have proceeded uh, a bit quickly. Uh, we did not understand, and the dames have not at this point authorized the addition of any new fencing. Uh, uh, I understood from the last meeting that that was a comment, I, I believe, by, by, by the chair. I didn't we did not understand that that was gonna be a requirement, so that was simply not an issue that the dames have considered, and it's not, I currently do not have the legal authorization to offer our agreement to that. It's now, now there's gonna be another round of, of, um, of conceptual drawings and whatever, and the dames will have to take all that under advisement. So I say this just so the record is very clear on what exactly the dames have agreed to at this point. They are open to considering anything reasonable. We are doing everything we can to try to move this process ahead as expeditiously as possible. But I think in this instance, it's led to some miscommunication and misunderstanding and uh, I think it would be helpful, for example, if there's gonna be a public hearing in the application, if we could get a little bit of notice of it, um, you know, within a few days rather than a few hours of when the meeting is gonna occur, that'd be super helpful. So we will go back, work, continue to work with 55 Sierra Street to try to come to some kind of reasonable resolution of this thing. But uh, it is somewhat distressing to hear decisions being made about what, what the dame's view, view shed is or isn't or what they do or do not think of it. Uh, so we would appreciate some better communication on these issues and I just feel it's important for everyone to hear that. So thank you for your time. Anyone else from the public wish to address this application? Okay, well I'll close the public hearing. Are there any further comments or questions from the board? Martin? I think we're offering you an out, a way to get through this. Um, I think we have some hangups. That we're, we don't have a full consensus here. I'm hearing different uh, comments. Uh, I can't support it because this fence, and it isn't a replacement in kind because you're intensifying the rooftop units. We have larger units. Um, so to me, that's not, we need to have those units 
uh, properly screened. And so uh, just to replace the, the fence the way it is is not a proper screening. It's not appropriate for the historic district and therefore I can't support it. I could support the 18 feet down, down the uh, slope of the roof. Others can't. But I'm just telling you, I think we're trying to give you an out by saying you can do the roof, you can do the units. We'd like you to come back with another proposal for the screen. Um, if, if this thing was rushed, I think it was rushed to accommodate the applicant. So, you know, I, you know, I, I think we have an out. Um, it's up to you to take it or not. Yes, Rich. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I know you were here last week and we're here again this week. Um, I just, from my from memory, last week, our concern was the side, screening it from the side uh, with the fence. We didn't bring up any issues last week about the existing fence and how we wanted them to change that. I don't know, with all due respect, how fair it is for us to not tell them that last week and then now tell them that again this week when this is already their second time presenting to us. Um, from my point of view, it makes it look like it makes us look less credible. Um, but I just want to urge that I, I just want to be fair to the client and I don't want to keep making them, you know, create another hoop every time they come to see us, especially when it's a business that, uh, you know, that's important to downtown. But I'll say that. Okay. I guess at this point I would want to know what the applicant would like to do. If you would like to have us make a ruling or if you'd like to have us allow you to continue this and make a full a more formal presentation or a full complete presentation at our next meeting if we can just have a moment sure, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. the design what's the design the design is discussed Do you have the minutes there I already have the minutes. Do you have the minutes on there? Not that I know of. It's not, okay. If it's not in the package, I wouldn't have it. What's this guy? The fence design was discussed last week. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Right. It was huge concern. Was there, there. Okay, it was. So that's not unimportant. Okay, I brought it. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't bringing no, up something new. you're not bringing up something new. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you might want to say something just so they heard what you said. Yeah. Right? Might have now? been unclear. Do I say that now? <laughs> no, I'd, I'd wait till they, yeah. I don't remember. Can I make a motion? Uh, no, hang on, John. John, we're, get, we're giving the applicant a moment to discuss with, uh, with the parties uh, yeah, involved. Yeah, I can hear. We expressed that we didn't like the way it was, though. I think somebody said that. We is a, a different term. Yeah. It was said. Yeah, I think it's fair. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, personally, I felt like this, the fence that was there was shabby. Yeah, it shouldn't yeah. be put back yeah. in place. I don't know that I said that out loud. I, I believe you did. I believe you yeah. did. If you did, be, I, I did. was just getting the this perception. This guy did over here. Yeah. They had the perception that we didn't Sure. And, and you know what? You're a counselor. It's so. No, don't. It's, it's okay. It's okay. I don't think. Uh, I don't think we should force the applicant to change. It's okay. Not, you know, okay, come back and address this. And then be like, sure. And now sure. we're going to make sure. Sure. They, um, Although they are replacing the mechanically. Full of reality here. Says they want to be replaced to do it. Back to hearing this again without the full public advertisement as a continuation was a thing that we threw them so that they could have an opportunity to react to some of our comments. I don't think we're the bad guys. How are we doing? Again, you are counseling. Do we have a decision? 
We've never done this before. This is crazy. Is it, it, it is, but Nobody's it is. Okay. Okay. Let it run the show for me. Yeah. I, I, get, I get the night. Well, we do have good fences. For air conditioners, right? We've already done that. We're going to do all this work. They're mostly just like the same. Handle fan. Like consistent with the quality of care. You know, for approved across the road or next to the garden. Fences for the, the one next to the garden. All the time? Yes, yes. Do they look at anything like that? Lower that like no. Okay, we wouldn't accept this for this yeah. building through yeah. there. Any other we need to be this tall. Oh, yeah. So if they had They're looked at our... They don't want to okay, I'm, I'm going to ask if you'd like to have time, we can move on with the next presentation and you can tell us what you would like to do later. But we can't hold this up any further. None of them look like this, and none of them would be accepted. It's rushed, I agree, but... If you make a motion and no one listens. There you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, we would like to uh, uh, take the offer, as you have suggested. We'd like to move forward with the mechanical replacement and the membrane roof, and we will take the fence off and uh, further design that and work with the dames and come back for just the fence piece. Excellent. Okay, so Clear so guidance. it sounds so it sounds as if we'll be um, approving the replacement yes. of the mechanicals, with the stipulation that an administrative approval will be put brought forward for a design for the fence that it's appropriate for the historic district, and with full specifications, heights, dimensions, viewpoints, and so on. And just, uh, it would be the applicant's desire that it's not an administrative approval, that it would come back for a hearing. You'd like to have a hearing? A hearing? Yes. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. You got it. Please go ahead to see you. I will need a motion. I'm going to cheat and say so moved. <laughs> I, would, I would like to, to make sure that the coping is involved in the edge of the roof as well. A stipulation. Okay. What was the stipulation? That the roof, the proper coping along the side of the roof membrane, because if they're ah, going to proceed yes. with the roof, that would be an important part. Yeah. Okay. So this is a motion for the approval of the replace, removal of the mechanical units, the work on the membrane of roof, the coping along the side, and the stipulation that another hearing come forward with the design of the fence in an appropriate historic style. Um, and the only concern I have is, is it possible that one would happen and the other does not? Uh, well, it's a stipulation of the, of the first one, so okay. it really has, it to, has happen. to happen. Okay. Um, excuse me? Yes. Oh. John? Yes. Um, Nick, can you hear me? Yes. 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 I'm wondering if Nick has explained to the applicant that a full hearing uh, means a full application and the full mailing of 10, 11 letters, et cetera, et cetera, whereas the um, AA is, is, is essentially much easier for them. Uh, I'm, I imagine they're aware of that, correct? Are they? They're nodding their head, John. We're good. Okay. okay. Karen. Is, is there a uh, stipulation for the, the uh, timing for when they would request a hearing or whatever so that we don't see them in a year? or? <laughs> Will you be ready by next month? I don't know that I can speak to that, but it certainly would come to Come to the mic, please. And next, next month means you need it in by Friday, so you're not going to be ready so for no. next month. Uh, yeah. Certainly within the next two to three months, we, we will be back here. But so, uh, why don't you say 90 days? 90 we're, days. We're going to really take our time on this with the client and then come back to you. So thank you for uh, splitting this up for us. Okay. Rich. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just want to say that I believe I misspoke earlier when we didn't bring up our concerns of the fence um, last week. Um, I just I want to apologize, I, but I am also not afraid to admit when I'm wrong. Um, but it is a concern of mine that we are always up front with any client, with any resident, any business, um, and that we work with you to keep the historic district commission, to keep the historic fabric of this town. But I just wanted to apologize. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, so do we have a clear motion? I'll make the motion. Thank you, John. 
Yes, that um, we have the uh, motion with the, as you spoke of the uh, roof and, and the mechanicals being changed um, with the curbing around the uh, roof also being altered and the fencing uh, being uh, put aside for another here. And I would just also like to say that I agree with Mr. Blaylock. Uh, so this is a full application, so we will need a roll call vote. But before that, um, did I get a, a second? second? Did I get a second? Second. Second. Okay, great. John, could we have findings of fact? Um, it it's certainly works into our district. It, it goes along with our guidelines, and it's uh, conducive to the other surrounding buildings. Um, Okay. It's a modern change, and it's really not uh, in our findings of fact. All right, we'll roll call vote then. Dan, if I could start with you. Yes. Martin. Approved. Rich. Yes. David. Aye. John. Yes. Reagan. Yes. Thank you for getting through all of that. Okay. <laughs> we are ready. We will look forward to seeing you in the next couple of months. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is a work session. We will be moving down to the tables. This work session is requested by the city of Portsmouth owner for property located at Marcy Street, Prescott Park, wherein permission is requested to allow exterior construction to an existing structure, elevate, remove additions, and relocate the Shaw warehouse on site. As per plans on file in the planning department, Said property is shown on Assessor Map 104 as Lot 5 and lies within the Municipal and Historic Districts. Okay. more chairs if we need them. Thank you. Joe, are you presenting? I am. Well, the whole team is presenting, but I'm just, I'm making introductions and... Uh... Uh, may I suggest when you're done with your personal introductions mm -hmm. that you give a brief overview of some of the risk findings that were presented to... Somebody, sorry, somebody... Risk findings? Mm -hmm. Uh, about half of the commission was not here for that original presentation, so some understanding as to why the building is being moved. Oh, yeah, that's part of the presentation, okay. which is, which is great, Very great, good. yeah. Okay. Now it's 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 part of the presentation, but what we have found when we present this project is it is so multi-headed. It's very easy to get taken off into a tangent. It's, it's part of the presentation that we have done the research, and we'll show you what the outcome was. But hopefully, the discussion doesn't become about specifically about the resiliency and the water level and so forth the, the fact is we've done the research and it's in here and in a bridge version Understood. very good okay. all right introductions thank you so my name is uh, joe almeida i am the um, facilities manager for the city of portsmouth uh, i'm here tonight with the design team and also there are members of the mayor's blue ribbon committee who are, who are in the audience uh, as well who have been working very hard with us on this um, tonight from weston and samson sherry ruane is to my left uh, Ted Talukian from uh, TT Architects and Carlos Guzman also from TNT. Um, again, tonight the purpose of tonight is we're, we're here just to show you where where um, what our progress has been. We are just um, wrapping up a lot of decisions over the past couple of years, and we were just wrestling with the exact date of when we've seen this group last. It's it's been over a year. It's been a long time. Um, so we just want to present to you where we are. There are still a lot of decisions to be made moving forward on, on architecture and, and so forth. But this is phase one of the master plan that we're implementing. 
Um, you're, you're going to see it in, in great detail here, but um, it involves some alterations to the Shaw building uh, that exists now. You're all very familiar with that, I'm sure. Um, so with that, let me not waste any more time and, and just let, let Sherry take over. Um, the slides that she has on her screen are identical to what you see here. Yeah, I think Nick's driving this bus, so that's great. Thank great. you. <laughs> um, so you can go right to the next slide. Um, and this is just a, a quick snapshot of really where we have been. Um, we, as, as many know, launched the master plan back in 2016 and had a very involved community engagement process as well as Blue Ribbon Committee engagement. Um, there was, we adopted the master plan and then uh, 2018 and 2019, we actually learned a lot about resilience, which we'll get into in just a second. Um, and then that sort of, we needed to reframe some of the improvements based on the resilience information. And we did some enabling engineering to really facilitate making sure that the master plan was gonna be able to be implemented and that it was gonna serve all of the goals that we had aspired to. So next slide. Um, this, is the, um, this is the master plan as it <coughs> stands, as it was adopted um, back in 2020. And the next slide actually has the resiliency features that we were just um, talking about. So really key here, there's two parts to the water equation. One is sea level rise and the other is stormwater, which is the rain that falls on the land and is running right to Prescott Park as the lowest point in this watershed. So it's really getting it from both sides, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So it's capturing stormwater and allowing and facilitating it to either flow into the river or to hold it temporarily in the park and then let it um, flow out once tides go down. And it's preventing sea level rise and, and seawater from entering the park, not only above the seawall, but also through subsurface infrastructure, which is outfalls that otherwise are just open pipes. And so um, a lot of this information is actually what informed phase one. In the original master plan, we had identified a different area of the park for phase one, but when this resiliency information came to light, it became clear that this core of the park was most important. That information also led us to um, understand that the Shaw, in fact, was at the lowest point in the park and was most vulnerable. And as a, um, an architectural asset and an important part of the community's history, we thought that raising it up was absolutely the right way to go. Once you've raised the building, it did become, um, the question became, is this actually the exact right spot for this? If we're raising it, moving it is much less of a hurdle. And so um, through, again, a very in-depth study, we decided that moving the um, Shaw towards Marcy to slightly higher ground actually served many purposes um, from a resiliency perspective from a park first perspective and also from an engaging the community perspective. And that allowed us to really think about this band that is created by the Shaw and the Sheaf, which is very wharf-like in its um, configuration, and allowed us to then think about how we make best use of the Shaw, which does include an addition, and then um, locating the stage in a really ideal position that allows us to um, make best and highest use of the site. So um, those were all parts and pieces of this, and I can answer more detailed questions if you're interested in it, but essentially it was all data-driven from storm and sea level. And the next slide um, is really, as we're implementing phase one, we had to do a little bit more work on the site that was geotechnical borings, stormwater infiltration, um, and schematic design, and here we are um, today, sort of in the midst, middle of this diagram, as we're going through um, bid documentation, and we're here just to update you on the project, have an open discussion about where things are headed, um, and get some feedback. Anything I'm missing? No, that's all very good. Okay, and with that, oh, one more thing, sorry. The next slide is just an overview of the site plan of phase one, so the black dashed line, um, yep, that one, is the limit of work, and you can see that there's improvements to Water Street that include um, some additional parking, 
Um, there's regrading of the lawn and there's configuration of pathways. Um, but the Shaw really is sort of the heart of this from a resiliency perspective. The, the only thing I would I'm add sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm, just, I'm just going to stop for a second and just make you aware that what we're seeing on our iPads and what we're seeing here are two totally different things. Right. I mean, there might be some overlap, but, but there's, we, there's up, we updated the slide. Yeah, we updated the slides. Okay, yeah. So just anybody's confused. That's why it's not your head. Okay. It's OK. It, we did Thank get you. something I apologize. Different. I didn't realize. So, so I should be facing this way. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Charming. I was just going to add the, the clarity that when we talk about I realize in, in some previous conversations with people when we talk about lifting the Shaw that we need to also explain that the grade is, is coming up with it as well. So we're, we're not looking to impact the architecture shot where you're going to all of a sudden see three more <coughs> three yeah. feet of foundation. The surrounding grades are significantly going to rise with it. As a matter of fact, the, what we call Liberty Park, which is a, a cross water street where the flagpole is and uh, you know, the, the, formal, the, the gardens there, the, what they call the um, trial, gardens. trial gardens, that height is basically the height that will be carried across water street and Shaw will be sitting on that that new grade to this basically the same height that Shafe is at right now. This the floor levels will be the will be the first floor levels will be similar. Yes. And then there's a transition from water to Marcy, which is the, the given sort of the benchmark that we're meeting back with. Say that again? The so the rate that grade raise the grade raising that um, Joe just talked about will transition back down to meet Water Street, uh, Marcy oh. Street at Marcy. its existing elevation. So Marcy Street remains intact. And then once you cr basically cross the threshold into the park and pass the player's ring, that's when Water Street will gradually ascend to these higher grades. Yeah. So where the steps are in that little fall off by oh, um, it's the gondola be, will be going. Correct. You got it, correct. exactly. Okay. Uh, and with that, I will pass it over to Ted. Oh, you're going to see it up oh, on the screen. And I think, yeah. Nick, you're yeah. going to be driving. Correct. That's right. Okay. Uh, actually, thank you. I think Sherry and Joe certainly gave a good high-level so overview. And just to reiterate, I'm particularly looking forward to this as a, a meeting where we can receive good feedback because it is a you know meeting essentially to, to get to have good discussion. Uh, one of the things that came up is really, I think Joe said, it's a very multi-headed project, and there's maybe a number of goals to put on the table. So we thought we'd start with that. And I think Sherry really nailed it in the beginning by saying, you know, at first it's a park first approach and with the vision to the master plan. And I think every, all the decisions are revolving around that. But particularly as it relates to the Shaw's building goals, um, preserving it, rehabilitating it, and restoring the Shaw building is going to be essential. That's really not a part of this presentation now in terms of the details that we'd like to get into in terms of you know, the materials and how those uh, restoration components come together, particularly the preservation. But the idea that the Shaw Building will be preserved in latter phases is something that is a, a particular um, part of the project. As Sherry pointed out, with resiliency and the sea level rise and raising the park grade, um, inherently connected to that is relocating and protecting the Shaw Building through cli climate resiliency interventions. And I, I look <laughs> at uh, preservation and resilience is hand in hand. In order to really preserve and think about the future of the Shaw, we have to think about how we can get it above those sea level uh, rise projections so that we can preserve it against any um, potential interventions that could come in the future through sea level rise. So that's the second part of what we're looking at. But as, as well with that is, um, aside from the material aspects of the Shaw and relocating it and protecting it, is certainly I think about how we're gonna use it and identifying the programming to meet not just the city requirements, but also ones that we can support um, the performing arts needs. And um, with that, we spent a good bit of time with uh, city staff and uh, some of the other users in terms of how to study a new construction addition uh, which could help minimize or eliminate the on-site trailers that exist during the Prescott Park Arts Festival. And a part of this altogether is certainly how we look at this is how we see it over time and how we prioritize a phase approach to the project. And that's something we'd like to sort of get some feedback as well. So with that, I thought I'd frame those high levels. Thank you, Nick. Um, secondly, I, we, we love the drawing process and the research that we do in our office. These are a lot of <clears throat> things that are familiar to you, but they help us understand the chronology on the site and what has occurred. And what I'm gonna do is show you a few slides where we've 
map through Sanborn maps and, and drawings, just the evolution of Prescott Park over time. So this is, of course, what it is today and highlighted in red is really some of the last vestiges on the park, which is the wharf, this idea that there's a strong linear line, the history of uh, that whole area is something we feel is could be a real strength of the, the project. Next, please. And we went back to 1920s, and this is a drawing that we created that overlays in magenta, which is some of the Sanborn maps of a lot of these wharf buildings that existed on the site. You see the dashed lines of where um, the edge of the, the piers were at once mm -hmm. point in time, and then you see the palimpsest sort of drawing where you see the layers of the green space from the park. And I think what it speaks to is this dynamic, you know, chapters that have been on the site and for us you know even to know that the shafe has moved at some point in the 20s or thereabout just talks to the chapters and the history and something we want to embrace next please and there's some great photos that we pulled through your archives which show you know that condition next and how the shafe has been moved which is quite fascinating i know probably all very <laughs> in integrated into it next and as we move towards the 60s you see the evolution of the park and you see how um, to the left in magenta, some of the uh, industrialization that occurred on the site next. And up through the 80s, you see again to um, the opposite side of the, um, the Shaw and how there was still, you know, maintaining this, this, this zone through the middle uh, where there was still the one last vestige of the industrial space. Next. And that's you see in the photo. And I think what this does, and you can see the, the actual stage existing in the lawn there, next. It sort of some, it really helps answer for us, you know, how this occurred, you know, where the stage was and, and how um, that swatch was located. So the, the chronology is there and it sort of raised some questions for us about, you know, when we were thinking about where the stage could be relocated and how this would affect, you know, the planning. And uh, next. And so with that, I think we start with this drawing, which really is a diagram that talks about where it is today. And some of the questions around that were how can we relocate the stage, you know, move some of the trailers and some of the tents that exist on the site that tend to overwhelm, I think, the park itself. Mm. And uh, also look at how we could um, improve the life safety and the um, accessibility and the egress of the Shaw building itself, while also just maintaining that wharf um, linearity that exists along Water Street, which really speaks to the history of the site. Next. So we dug into some conversations. Uh, we met with uh, the staff from PPAF as well as the city. Uh, we measured some of the um, trailers, really began to understand like how much square footage does exist with these trailers and these components if we we're going to remove them and try to get them off from the site and to allow the, the open space to exist. Next, and we realize that there's about 4,000 square feet that are approximately accounted for with some of the planning. Next. We also studied the building, <coughs> looked at the egress, the accessibility, and if we, are to if we are to move and relocate and may possibly change some of the uses that, you know, a second means of egress may be necessary, accessible access through an elevator or lift, if the, the public or employees were to continue to use those buildings were necessary, as well as sprinkler systems, electrical, all these things that make up buildings would be necessary in a possible addition uh, to the building to help uh, really um, the Shaw um, be restored properly. And just to pause you for one second, yeah. is it, that's a great place to pause and, and just to remind that the, if an addition is considered the sheer amount of space that all of those modern mechanical mm -hmm. systems and conveying systems take up that we're, we're trying to not force them into the Shaw building. We want to put them into, into the addition. Yeah. And there's a minimum size building that would be required to do that. Yeah. Um, again, you'd think of, of, of rated, a rated stairwell that goes up against the Shaw, an elevator shaft, an elevator machine room, an electrical room, mm -hmm. fire suppression with pump rooms. Um, and so forth, restrooms, janitor's closets, it, it very quickly becomes, a, it starts to drive the size of the addition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, well put, Joe, thank you. Uh, next, please. Um, so <clears throat> thinking about the addition and the phased approach and, and particularly around the preservation along with the resiliency, um, picking up the Shaw and relocating it 
in a way that could create opportunities for an addition that could satisfy some of those needs was of interest. And this diagram begins to explain, you know, that movement. Next. And uh, this is, a, I think, a photograph from the Shafe that really shows you what I think Sherry was speaking to, which is that diagonal line, excuse me, that horizontal red line is the approximate grade that would be created, um, that would create the um, elevation that potentially when we pick up and relocate the Shaw that would get it out of that potential flood zone, but also make strong connections to the park, to Liberty Park, of course, mm -hmm. and to the open space. I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, I will. Just because when we first looked at this back in 2016, a thing that kept coming up in public comment was how bifurcated the park mm -hmm. felt. Like it was two separate parks with this road down the middle. And that the sheaf ended up being this sort of island in and of itself. And it was a big goal to reconnect. And so this move actually allows us to do that both vertically and horizontally in a way that really ties everything back together. Yeah, and you know, just to speak to some of the other you know preservation techniques, we will be when looking at you know raising the building. Uh, we we have been studying you know Secretary of Interior standards on flood adaptation and ideas around dry flood proofing the basement. You know, moving the, the utilities out of the floodplain, um, protecting those utilities, uh, certainly elevating the building and elevating the interior structure. All going to be a part of the future studies that we'll be evaluating. Uh, next. Oh, no, it's okay. Um, this is a, a drawing that kind of speaks to a lot of actual people who are involved in what we've been doing okay. in, this, in these last few months. Um, we have our structural engineer involved. We've been doing a lot of forensic analysis. We've been in the basement. Actually, Carlos has been a lot yeah. in, the, in the crawl space. Lots of spiders. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, you know, measuring how the building has been built, documenting it, realizing, you know, that the structure needs some... Uh, you know, a little TLC. Uh, some of the structure is out of plumb, and certainly there's been some sagging in some of the areas. And you know, that's going to be a part of that restoration project. And you know, what you know, we're not looking right now at those restoration, or excuse me, I should say, preservation techniques around the siding and the corner boards and the windows and the roof and all those things. But something we come to you in future phases. But but these are all aspects that need to be considered. And this is just a quick snapshot of you know some of that preliminary study. Next. So here we are uh, here, and I think this is, you know, at a point where it shows you the choices that we've been looking at. So, you know, after we consider picking up and, you know, relocating the Shaw, getting it out of the floodplain, and then the opportunity that exists when we can move the stage and move the supporting arts festival components, we realize that it still takes up a lot of space in the park uh, when we have the building, you know, standing alone and that there are a lot of what if scenarios that were raised around those square footage analysis and the programming analysis of how the building was used. And you know, we begin to look at the, the addition next as an opportunity that could um, you know, clean up the site to some extent with some of these you know, pieces that exist during the temporary periods of the festival, but also as Joe pointed out, provide accessibility, egress, and this is very much a diagram. It doesn't describe at all, you know, the design. Um, it doesn't really necessarily speak to the entirely about the scale that it could be at, but it just begins to show you the next pay phase in terms of how we can encapsulate a lot of these, you know, programming components and put them, you know, within the building. Yeah, and it's worth, it's worth uh, pausing also to understand that the reason why we are coming forth and showing you exactly where we want to put the Shaw now, the going through the exercise of determining what a potential full addition would be places the Shaw in the in the um, prime location. That's not to say that the addition has to be that full addition, but we don't want to move the Shaw and then wish we had moved it 10 more feet. We want to fully inform ourselves if you want all trailers eliminated and right. you want to find, so that that is why we're asking for this location and hopefully you're, you're convinced that We've, we're, we've informed that location with the research that we've done. Thank yeah. you. And, and also just thinking about those, those earlier drawings that we showed you from the 20s and the layering and this idea that, you know, wharf could still exist with the way the buildings are, are designed in a way that, you know, creates that linear line along Water Street, you know, makes a linear connection to the shave, you know, and then thinks about, you know, that, that sort of sense of history. And that's something that we could, you know, further study. But I think there's a real opportunity there. Next, please. 
and, and certainly as we look at the next you know, phase of, of our study and research is understanding and getting feedback from you, you know, as well about, you know, what is a new building, you know, addition do? And we, we, we look to the Secretary of Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties, and, you know, how does it retain the historic relationship between the buildings and the landscape? You know, what is the particular architectural style and how can we preserve, you know, the building's character? These are all significant questions that, you know, we would want to look and study around its compatibility and its appropriateness you know how it's connected the, the sort of recess or the space between the buildings the roof line the relative hierarchy all these are, aren't here now but something that we want to look at in the future and certainly your feedback on this would be uh, very significant next and another you know I think part of this you know wharf idea and the linearity is you know how can we reinforce that historic line uh, with the location of the, the stage itself. You know, getting it back in line, you know, with the structures along Water Street. Uh, this is actually just um, taking the stage that exists right now and picking it up and moving it. It's not actually designed. We think there's an opportunity here where we can begin to think of the stage as a part of the whole, you know, stretch of buildings together. And what is that experience like and how does it speak to, you know, the overall architecture and sense of place there, but but it begins to show you how those pieces can begin to be stacked and layered together, much to some extent like those 1920s, right. uh, you know, floor plans. Next, right. please. And then this is just you know I think a diagram that sort of captures you know some of the pieces that are happening on the backside of the building. Um, which is, you know, significant accessibility, universal access. Um, the pieces that Wesson and Sampson is working on with regrading the site is not just, I want to say, around flood, you know, preservation, right, no. but it's a lot around accessibility, how we can create, you know, roadway ramping that meets ADA requirements, um, adding a, a, a sidewalk that creates a safer pedestrian yeah. access to the water, um, looking at <coughs> alternate ways where parking can be uh, nestled, I think, very delicately within the landscape to not overwhelm the landscape, the park itself. Um, and also, you know, this experience about, you know, walking across between Liberty Park and Prescott Park in such a way that can make con greater connections. And uh, next. And, and certainly just another level, which is, you know, how it's being used. And just not to get you into all the details, but, you know, it's, you know, can we create structures that really are, are adaptable and can serve multiple functions and really, you know, for the first time, allow the Shaw to be really experienced by the general public. Um, and it could be a great space that could be used for a variety of different purposes and be a part of, you know, the community. Next. And we just put these side by side here to help, you know, frame the discussion and, you know, we look forward to your feedback. I don't know if there's anything else, Joe. That no, that was add. very thorough. Thank you. Thank you. I think too, just hearkening back to the beginning of the whole project is that this park first approach really was born out of this feeling that at times, you know, other things were taking precedent over the park itself and that the park was really being over leveraged. And so these moves are in, a, in support of park first, meaning that things have a place and that the landscape itself can't just be, you know, sort of unfettered access all over the place. It's a much more consolidated um, use and strategy that I think really brings the park to be in its prominent, in a prominent position. Thank you. Thank you. Any initial comments and questions? Yes, Dan. One of your goals was to open both sides of the park together. And I think that would need an open stage like that. Is that planned? Do you know? what the future stage is planned to be? So at this point, it is a um, movable stage. That's what has been endorsed in the <coughs> master plan mm -hmm. um, for many reasons. And, um, you know, there's certain components to a stage that we believe are gonna just serve the city better than the one that's there now, which has lived a very long life and has been <laughs> bolstered by many people in the community. Um, just in construction, from construction perspective. Um, so we actually believe that whether it is temporary, um, the movable strategy is that there are parts and pieces to this that do need to be improved just from a baseline of safety and use. 
And so that's a conversation I think that when we get to, we need to design the stage, not just repurpose the one that's yeah. sitting in the middle of the yeah. park. That's mm -hmm. exactly the type of question that we're going to be. But that, I think I think I understood your question. It was really interesting about the transparency. Yeah. That those two diagrams side by side actually speak a lot to maybe where that could go. Yeah. Uh, you know, if where the addition, what the addition opportunity um, provides is an opportunity to free up space on the site that you you know, ironically, you could say, allows for greater transparency, right. allows for greater visibility, allows for a better passage between the site. And I think, as Sherry pointed out, the design of the stage is really, you know, something that needs to be looked at, you know, particularly um, in terms of not just when it is being used, you know, when an event is occurring, but we've done a lot of park structures. And I think one of the things that we find is the multiple opportunities that exist with these structures, where that on one hand being used, they're clear what their uses are, but how do they exist in a park when they're not being used? You know, are they passive seating areas, are they right. sometimes public education spaces? Mm -hmm. You know, all these things would be a very interesting next, you know, uh, next phase uh, discussion. Yeah. With you moving the shawl up closer to Marcy Street, and if that stage ever became solid, you're really building a huge wall between the two parks. Yeah. So that that is a concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is a great moment where the stage could be allow that transparency yeah. over that yeah. visibility, yeah. but you know, allow for a certain degree of you know semi transparency at times. You know, where mm -hmm. where the, the the arts festival could could thrive. One last question? Yes. No? Okay. When you talked about leveling off the grade, what's the um, floodplain and everything on the sheaf? Is that yeah, up there so, already? Or? Yeah, so the sheaf is actually almost four feet higher than the Shaw. Okay. Um, and so it's, you know, it's less vulnerable. And I'll say that one of the improvements that we are looking at from a resiliency perspective is adding another course of granite block on the seawall not to build it up to be a barrier, but just to add a little bit more freeboard. And some of that will also be looking at the sheaf and how protective measures um, are possible there. But it is actually okay. higher Good. and currently drier than the shot. <laughs> True. Thank Martin? you. Martin? Yeah, I wanted to pick up on what Dan uh, was talking about. You had mentioned that one of the problems was that the park was bifurcated. Yeah. And I agree. I, 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 I see that too. I see the asphalt street, the water street being part of that problem. And I too would like to see this, the, um, the shawl pulled closer and, and closer to the player's ring so that you do create sort of and define that space between the player ring mm -hmm. and the shawl. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, I would prefer to see that the, the stage come around and address the bridge um, this way that some of this utilitarian buildings, the, the addition and things that serve the stage uh, would be confined to this area and then you'd have more flow between the, mm. the two sides of the park. Mm -hmm. Are we commenting on the massing of the addition at this point or is that just? No, just, just no, the, only, the only statement that we have about the massing of the addition is that that dimension is what would be required in order to house everything in the addition. Right. If, if the choice was made by um, the powers that be to house everything in the addition, we'd be coming to you with uh, a volume of that size. Okay. Yeah. But um, that we're, we're not really we're not really here to discuss the exact size of that right now. It's, it's, yeah. it's up for discussion if you want to, but right. and we, I'd offer that's to our future phases. And yeah. it also underscore that, you know, that is just a very simple diagram. Yeah. It doesn't mm -hmm. speak to the roof line, the necessary yeah. height, um, the space between, I think, needs to be studied. I think materiality and, you know, the, the it, solid. Um, it's, a, it's a simple diagram, but it's, a, it's also a simple solution. These are simple buildings. Yeah. These are simple buildings with, mm -hmm. with, with very few, with few materials and they, they, they they express themselves in a very simple and straightforward way. It, that's why the diagram is just showing you, a, you know, an extruded uh, gable, because right. <clears throat> that's what exists. And I'll offer just on the on the stage when that is designed, there's opportunity there for um, ensuring that a, 
a redesigned stage has the highest level of functionality in the stage itself mm -hmm. and is more efficient. And also from a sound perspective, there are requirements with sound booths and things like that that currently um, on the axis it's set all fall into place. Rotating those, which we have looked at and actually had looked at previously, do start to present other complications. Not to say it's not possible, but it's um, that You're saying configuration. noise leaving the site and affecting the rest of the neighborhood? Is no, no, no. Case? Just the configuration of stage and sound booth and equipment and the configuration that those need to be on in an ac the axis okay. and the maybe, setup. Maybe I, I think I, I like to say, you know, the phrase exit stage left is that it's where they're coming from and so a lot of pieces that are housed let's say in those tents are back of house uh, components that where people come to the stage they're now could be housed inside the building and so the the immediacy of the stage to the addition is really a functional mm -hmm. relationship as is it is as much um, let's say a design you know issue as well okay I just I just think that it's a very poor placement the stage is just yeah, I, I think something more creative could be accomplished um, by moving the 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 shaft further, the shawl the shawl further down, and and making a better, bigger building, making a bigger addition, uh, and having all the space you want, and still linking both sides of the park. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, I think that's definitely worth saying. I think we probably didn't reinforce enough is in the stage's current location, it's actually centered on the lawn. Mm -hmm. So it sort of works to the optimal, you know, relationship of the lawn to the stage. And that certainly couldn't mean that if rotating the stage yeah. could still accommodate that. If you look at the diagrams, you see this ghosting, <coughs> this ghosting of this, this, this track of path that goes around what, what we are referring to informally as this, the bowl mm -hmm. here, where the stage is now, it's in the middle of the bowl. So that actually is going to be, the, the grade, act, it, it, it's going to be a large grassy bowl so that when you're, seat, when you're sitting in there, it provides an optimum view of the stage. And this, this path that's surrounding the bowl could actually be, you know, could actually at some point become part of the performance even. You're gonna have people, you know, navigating around the seating area in a very, in a very easy way. So the stage has to address the seating area. And then beyond that, there's, we're still using, there's, there's sound booth to consider, there's concession stand to consider, there's all of those things that, mm that are off the screen here that mm -hmm. are in future phases that w when we consider placement of things, we, we, we consider those as well. Rich. Thank you. I'm uh, just curious. You mentioned the bowl and I know we're raising the grading where the Shaw building is now. So would it kind of grade up to the bowl and then kind of fall into the bowl kind of thing or I don't I mean, so not that it, I, the edge will be flush. You know, the, the grade is raising around the Shaw. It will be flush, and then it will. There will be a gentle slope towards the center of that performance yeah. lawn. Yeah, yeah. And not only does it create sort of optimal seating, right? And so it's not blankets yeah. and then chairs. It's right. that, but also it's a stormwater functionality. Okay. That that's yeah. where I stormwater it is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure a, you, you know, you guys are experts in. Like, yeah. Uh, that's that's, um, that's its biggest function, actually. Yeah, right. yeah. It's, 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 it's my uh, novice brain would be like, well, it's not going to be just a big puddle I'm sitting. No, in. it's <laughs> not. It's not right? <laughs> that's right. Right. Thank you. Yeah. David? Uh, too many things. Um, let's just one. start. Um, you, the wharf idea. What was the wharf idea? I missed that part altogether. I think it came from our just really study of history on the site. And I, I think that slide from the 1920s was fascinating, you know, with the number of buildings that existed in that location and the idea, you know, much the way a wharf exists with a series of linear buildings along a, 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 a road or, yeah. or a stretch of land. Much the way it is now is what you're saying. Correct. Yeah, and the, the abundance of it. And that, you know, with some of these moves, you know, that, that, are, that could be occurring, the idea of making sure we maintain the wharf idea. That linear yeah. march yeah, exactly. of these buildings. Exactly. Um, but it seems like the marine railway and that idea is gone if you're going to build your stage right in the middle of it your bowl uh well it would be on online right with the axis of the building so it, it's yeah. it's currently in the bowl yeah. right right yeah. now yeah to your so point. i see what you're saying yeah, yeah. yeah the historic okay. yeah. railway yeah. yeah um 
you're going to raise this some three feet? Two and a half to three at the shah, yeah. You said up to the level of the sh the sheaf. So the grade. You said the sheaf was four feet above that's the right. level so of the, the shah. That's right. The um, grade will be raised two and a half to three feet, and then there's actually a 12 inch foundation that. On the sheaf. On the, on the um, shah. 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 Yep. yep. <laughs> sheaf is the one we were told was four feet above the shaw. That's right, and the shaw will get there by this one foot of. I see. You're going to add foundation. another foot on That's top right. of that, so the building's actually going to go up Correct. more than that, That's two and right. a half to three. Okay, um, you're going to raise the parking area up also. Correct. And you're going to maintain in this idea of unifying the park. You're going to maintain a street and parking on it. But it's gonna. But, but it's gonna be good parking. It's gonna be. It's not transparent be, parking. It's gonna. <laughs> Come it, on. It won't if be. If I told you, you mean, I was you making mean? a transparent unification yep. between two objects yep. and put a parking lot in yep. it yep. with cars, yep. then you would think that would be good. No, you have to. Yep, what we're considering is the fact that the the performance <clears throat> to, man, to the performance requires vehicular access to it. Of course, there's fire truck access as well. But the parking spaces, if you, see the, if, you, if you see the entire master plan, again, if you look at it, we're actually eliminating parking in other places within the park. So the parking numbers have been reduced significantly. So, and, this is, and these are the ones that remain. This parking there now, as you know, but we're, we're doing pull-in yeah. to add a few, to, and to, to say, keep a few more. I'll say this too, yeah. Water Street, which used to run, or currently runs, right up to the sheaf mm. is actually getting pulled Shortened. back. Yeah. And the parking that is up against the That's sheaf right. is actually being pulled closer yeah. and being nestled between some of the landscape and yeah. hopefully um, screened. Right. And by, right. And by right. rotating it, instead of having parallel along and rotating it, it's actually shortening our need for asphalt that deep into the park and allowing us to make a much greener um, pedestrian prioritized connection. John or Reagan, do you have questions? Um, I have a few comments. Um, basically, uh, I'm heading in the same direction as David um, about Water Street and um, the parking lot. Uh, and wondering why uh, the Water Street needs to be paved at all. Wouldn't it be more appropriate if it was um, heavily graveled and crushed up oyster shells and all that sort of thing. If it, if it weren't more of a nautical uh, street. Um, and also uh, the additions on the back, um, I understand, you know, because of uh, your program, you need to have a, a large addition. And I agree that um, taking your cues from the Shaw and, and the sheath is the way to go. Uh, as a matter of fact, I can see um, if the stage weren't, up against Water Street. Um, if the buildings were along Water Street and the stage were more in front of the new addition, that all of a sudden you kind of created what used to be with the fact that, you know, all of the large docks, the long dock, etc., they all had a line of buildings on one side of them for not all of them, but most of them had a line of buildings on one side that were used for various, you know, cordage and sail making and probably supplies and things like that. So you would have that kind of look um, on the other side, so on Water Street. And um, so with that, I, I would hope that we can all agree that the that the design uh, should be taken um, in that direction, you know, with the shingles and et cetera. And, you know, just a, a healthy space between the two buildings mm -hmm. with maybe a connection on the first floor or something if it needs to be, but um, a, a healthy space. Uh, I think that's, a, you know, a, a way to go. That's what, what I would like to see it. And, um, you know, right now I can see that most of what you're discussing is all engineering. And, uh, so uh, I don't have anything else to say. Thank you. Reagan? I'll chime in. Um, I just want to say how excited I am by this presentation. Um, you know, several years ago, there was a committee of us that got together and really studied historic buildings and, and the threat of sea level rise and um, 
looked at all the various ways that it could be addressed and this is actually doing some of those things which is fantastic to see that our city is actually implementing um the these ideas and these strategies so retaining the building lifting it up moving it i have no problem with that that's a um i think a wonderful way to preserve it um to move it to higher ground uh i appreciate just how much you've studied and looked at um at the history and the site plan obviously it's just a very very in-depth study that you guys have worked on um I also, I, I think it's a great idea to utilize this sort of dead space in between there. As far as I'm concerned, I've, <laughs> my children love to run around in that sort of vacant uh, grass lot during uh, summer performances because they get bored. Um, <laughs> but I think that certainly the plan that we have up here now opening it up and creating this much larger bowl as you're calling it is a much better use of the space much better way to unify the park um and 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 pull it all together and use all the wonderful space that's there so um i'm feeling really positive about the direction that this is going i'm not going to nitpick about any of the designs or anything like that yet um <laughs> I'm just curious. I'm very excited to see where you guys will go um, from here. So I'm. Um, thank you. Okay. Any other comments by the commission before we hear from the public? Okay. I'll open this to public comment. Would anybody from the public like to come up and speak to this presentation? And we have somebody. Good evening. If you could introduce yourself, please. Sure. Elizabeth Bratter, 159 McDonough Street, property owner. Um, I didn't write anything down, so I'm winging it because I really couldn't understand what the plan was. Um, I'm, I appreciate that you want to raise the buildings because I think that's important. Resiliency and environmental issues are huge in my vocabulary. Um, I'm concerned, is the stage going to be backed up to the quote-unquote addition? So or? that hasn't been determined yet. The, okay. the, the stage has to be designed. As we're showing it in, and I don't know, Nick, if you the can go to the side. next. Yeah, that yeah there. Um, here, it's actually shown in line. So it's, um, a, it's right next to the addition. It's not in front or. But it's facing the same direction it does now. Correct. You're not turning it to face the south end. That's right. right. OK. That's so right. that was one of my concerns. Um, the other concern I have is um, Martin talked about authentic stuff with buildings at one of the meetings I was at last week. And I'm thinking of him. He's smiling. I'm thinking about that addition. And, I'm wondering if you could leave the stage where it is and create a building around the stage, which would therefore, thereby create a sound proofing or a sound reducing mechanism as opposed to putting it against that. And I'm gonna tell you the reason why. I've been to Prescott Park a million times. I lived in Portsmouth 35 years. I'm still here every day. Um, and the one thing that I find is that when there's a play going on, you can still go over to the whale, you can still lie in the sun if you want to, you can still go to the flower gardens and take pictures, you can still go to the, I don't know which one's which, Sheaf or Shaw, but you can go down and see the boats being made that used to ferry across the river and try to envision them getting across that river. Um, but once you move the stage closer to that end of the park, that ability to visit that end of the park and utilize it has now been removed. I like the idea of raising it up and creating one level as opposed to having to go down the stairs to get to the other part, but I don't like the idea of the stage being moved into that end because that is technically a separate park because when a play is going on, you can't hear yourself talk. Right. So you want to be able to get over there and you want to, tourists like to come and visit and so do locals. Those buildings are very interesting to see, and the summer is really the best, the only time you can see them. I think they're open till fall. The other thing I would like to see is I realize we're trying to protect the, the building closest to the wharf. What, what are the name of those, the boats, please help me? The gondola. The gondola. No, not the gondola, the little ones that they used to make. 
Oh, the Historic Commission. Oh, I'm sorry. The Wearies? The Wearies? The Lor yeah, the little lorries and stuff. The, they the have a, um, in that building, they have a guy who makes, who used, to, who used to make them. I don't know if he's still there. So I would rather see that lifted up and kept on the water because it helps you to envision what it was like to, that's the real history of Prescott Park is that was where the ferry was and the rail was there. And so to move that building back, to preserve so, it is a good idea, but to raise it up would be, I mean, to raise it, to protect it. That's just so my thinking. When, when you, you were speaking a little bit about the shafe. Which is the one on I don't the know water. Which one. The, one on the, the one on the water. The one right. on the water. Is That's what, the one. Come on, comment on that one. I would like you to raise it up and leave it by the water. We're not touching well, that, yeah, one. that one. Oh, okay, that, you're not going to. That go. one is in it. That one actually is very well protected. Oh, okay, good. And if you saw one of the early diagrams that was presented, that was actually relocated from from the Mechanic Street Wharf. So that's not the original location. Yeah, I know. It used to be down by Gino's. Yep. I, just to address, you had asked about when you say the stage is original. Do you mean its current location, building around its current location? Wherever you're going to move it, leave it in its similar to the current location, and then put the building around it like a half circle I see. type I see. thing. So, so you're not, you weren't. I just want to make clear: there's, there's no way that we could actually leave the stage where it is and build around it. We just can't do that. No. And you weren't suggesting that, okay? And no. it's not. And also, just so um, there's clarity around this, we're not proposing that the stage be in the Liberty Park where the trial gardens are. That is not. No, no, no. Okay. You're, you're just proposing it being that when you move the Shaw building closer to Marcy yeah. Street, that you're gonna put the stage in front of the quote unquote addition so that they can access it for the place. Right. And all I'm saying is that when you do that, you eliminate the access to those buildings when plays are going on, in my opinion. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And again, noise is a, is, is a big issue and that's why I think the direction should stay the way it is. Yeah. Um, one of you talked about, let's keep it closer to the bridge because that way it has that. Tip. So those are my comments for now. Um, I look forward to seeing what comes up next. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you very much. much. Anybody else from the public wish to speak? Uh, good evening. My name is Tom Watson, and I'm at uh, 200 Newcastle Avenue. I'm also chair of the uh, Prescott Park Master Plan Implementation Committee. I hadn't planned to speak, but I, I did want to uh, uh, comment uh, on the previous speaker's uh, suggestion and also maybe add a little extra context to some of the things, uh, questions that the commissioners have uh, addressed. Um, the, the key thing to keep in mind with the master plan, which as somebody observed is a park first plan, uh, but a, a plan that also acknowledges that the arts are an important component, component of the park is that the, the master plan is really a series of compromises that allow all those things to interact while still maintaining that park first. And uh, a key component of uh, that, that balance, if you will, is this uh, uh, seating bowl or, or uh, uh, audience area. Um, and that's there for the, uh, that's designed for the very specific purpose of uh, identifying that portion of the park which will be devoted to the arts the, in, the, in the community that shows up there. The size of that area is important because it defines the size of crowd that will uh, be accommodated. Uh, the path that surrounds it is important because it, it defines the boundaries that that audience will be requested to stay within. Um, it was, it was located where it is because it also uh, keeps what used to be a crowd spread that would head toward the Memorial Bridge, toward the old uh, uh, Pier 1 building. Um, and so it, it's very important that that seating bowl be recognized as, as important. It also addresses this gentleman's concerns about the orientation of the stage. Um, and it also uh, addresses the concerns about the dispersal of sound, many of which have now been uh, uh, addressed in the last couple of years as a result of uh, the purchase of new sound equipment and the in in increasing uh, improvement in sound technology that will be able to focus sound. Um, the other part of that that is important is when, when we talk about unifying the park, uh, 
uh, there were several components that uh, reached that ability. <clears throat> One is to raise what, you, what is Water Street so that it's no longer uh, uh, inaccessible uh, to easily trans uh, uh, transfer from one part of the park to the other because of the stairs, the difference in elevation. Uh, the other is, again, with that seating bowl, uh, it allows for, even during performances, the ability for anybody to go through the park on this long pathway that starts at what will be the new entrance at the intersection of State Street and Marcy Street and will work its way all the way through uh, to the uh, past, past the trial gardens and to the Mechanic Street entrance. Uh, that is meant to be open and available without any uh, handicap uh, impediments uh, throughout all you know, 24 hours a day. Um, and so that's why it, it, you may recall that the original plan that was adopted by the City Council in January of 2017 actually had the stage up in a, in a more diagonal location uh, between the existing Shaw location and the player's ring. It's because of these uh, uh, environmental issues that has caused us to say we can't, it, by having to move Shaw closer to Marcy Street, we can no longer keep the stage there. The original bowl that was uh, approved by the city council uh, was, was on a more diagonal orientation. We can't do that anymore. That's why we're, we're now looking at how to accommodate a, a redesigned bowl and therefore to line up the, the, uh, um, the buildings, temporary and otherwise, that would be necessary to, to both fully use the seating bowl and to allow the park to continue to have an equal flow of people at all times. Uh, to the prior speaker's comment, uh, the problem therefore becomes if, if you were to keep the existing stage location, you wouldn't have a seating bowl because you'd literally have the stage in the middle of the seating bowl, which would cause people to have to disperse back into the other areas, uh, uh, for instance, the public speaking forum mm -hmm. and those areas, which is one of the primary things we were trying to solve in that master planning process. The other would be you'd have the stage sitting in the middle of a potential water retention area, which would cause all sorts of ha uh, safety hazards. You can only imagine the problems with electrical and otherwise mm -hmm. if you're sitting in the middle of a retaining pond. So those really are my comments. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. As you can see, our, we, our, we're very lucky to have the, the Blue Ribbon Committee members, all of them are incredibly well informed about the park's history and mm -hmm. all of these issues. It's been a very long process, the master plan, this, all the approvals over the years. It's, it's a very, um, it takes a lot of work and research to keep up with it all. There's, there's, there's a reason for every single decision. Every decision has a history on, on, the, on the park. There's a reason why we go in these directions. So Tom's a great example of how well informed our members are on the committee. They've been an extreme, extremely helpful uh, group. Thank you. Anybody else from the public wishing to speak? No? Okay. Which I'll close the public work session. Any other comments or questions from the commission? Yes, Martin. Uh, Dan, did you want to make your comment yes, first? Uh, just a quick question. How much bigger is that seating area it's, from yeah. present to, to proposed? It's, um, it's not quite double because of the configuration, but it has greatly increased a contiguous discernible seating area and maintained this promenade through the park that does not interfere and that was a big call to action at the beginning it's actually it's not as much square footage like in terms of size as much as the relocation of the stage just makes it more right. the right. more, the efficiency more efficiency is far greater because yeah. the crowd was spilling you know all the way to the whale yeah. and all the yeah. way and now it's a more contiguous I think my question, I'm sure you have an answer for it, is what bothers me is you, you have the shawl moved, you have the addition, and then you have the stage. And to me, they look all, they, they look incongruous. Mm -hmm. Why isn't the, the, the addition is there to support the stage. Why not make the stage part of the design of the addition and do it all in one? You mean that mean to, to a hard construction of the stage, a permanent Absolutely. stage? Yeah, yeah that, that that gets into what we're 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 currently not allowed to. 
there, there are, we're not, we can't do a permanent stage. What the, uh, the, um, the agreement doesn't allow us to right now. I guess on the temporary side, though, is the question, um, you said contiguous or incongruent, Incon with it, yeah. incongruent. You know, I think that's just a question, which is, you know, what is a temporary stage design yeah. look like? Right. You know, that makes right. it more consistent with the waterfront and sort of the wharf idea. If that's what you were asking, I'm not sure. And, and you know, there's yeah. nothing to suggest that we can't, that, that, I mean, that stage where it is right now on that, that phase two diagram, we, you know, we're showing it behind the addition. I mean, it, it can move off of what, off of that axis. If you want to give domin dominance to the buildings and get the stage off the axis, it's possible for us to pull the stage forward off the axis. Towards the ball. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, we've yeah. done it before. We, we've, we have diagrams where, like, on, on the, the, the phase one condition on the left shows it pulled forward. Mm -hmm. um, but again, when we, fully design the addition and the stage right. and understand how yeah. during a performance how, how right. people might want to be going in and out of the building using it for for changing costumes or as a green room or where the band is seating this all of that still needs to be uh, considered and, and, and by putting the show where we're proposing it now allows us to have that full discussion and study yeah yeah that's a well well framed Joe yeah. David? Following that idea, um, it, it seems like this is probably the last shot we have of lining up a group of we'll call mercantile looking buildings along mm -hmm. the axis of what was once a wharf. Uh -huh. I would think that we'd want to take as many steps as we could, given that this is a clear canvas at the moment, mm -hmm. or a relatively unsullied right. canvas. But we would take as many steps as we could to, to reinforce a waterfront looking road on one side, mm -hmm. to reinforce the waterfront, that linear yeah. part of it. The idea of putting a, a barely above grade, square, heavily lit, modern <clears throat> deck stage as part of that grouping seems in, uh, like a, a little too anachronistic. And the idea of pulling that stage away from the building so that we could have these historic wharf buildings and your new access building, which is going to look something like one of them, mm -hmm. reinforcing this theme again. Again, they, we can't line up five homeowners to build their homes in a line like this and cover them with shingles. But we can, in a public setting, take yeah. a theme and run that snot out of it. Right. 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 Yeah. Uh, it seems like a, a better use of the theme to, to slightly disengage this idea of a platform, a performance platform from this linear yeah. mercantile row. Just a thought, keeping with the theme. To, to, to speak further to that, Nick, can you go to the slide? I think it's a site plan that should, I think it's a 1920 site plan. I was, I was, uh, I was we so have a, to see this. we have an application coming up you do. later. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Continuing with the thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. we have an application coming up tonight. We've all seen uh, something to do with a building on Prey Street, a, a new proposed building, and we got a little inset from a map from yeah. a couple of you know a hundred years ago or more. Yeah. We got a little inset of a map showing the area and the linear mm -hmm. access yeah. to the water that that. Along the waterfront today, we have houses sprinkled along the yeah. Marcy Street and whatever. But back in this time, when these buildings were built, this idea of access to the water, access to the water, and all roads went yeah. right to the water. There it is right there on the screen. I mean, when, on the axis that we're talking about, you can see how many buildings were on that, that mm. axis, that rail, as we call it. Mm. And then to the left, I mean, it's, just, it's, it's so... Open. Exaggerated. It's unbelievable that the, the linear buildings just heading if, right to the piers. If there was a, a thing that you could figuratively accomplish in the midst of doing your other task, to line this up, to create an opportunity for people to see that, yeah. to get a, a, an idea that would help them see what you were doing yeah. so much more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. And, and I would even go as far as like when these are in their line, how do they also relate to the, to the sheaf? Right, mm -hmm. because it's it's not just the Shaw and the addition and let's say the stage, but it's the complete set of parts as it relates as far out to the water as the sheaf. So, that's an exciting set of connections and how they all work yeah. together. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, you so much.
So, Joe, yeah. you're not asking for any kind of approval tonight. You are updating right. us with. If you with see, we, we on our on our phase one target dates, there's a <laughs> it goes out, you know, through through the end of the year. But we'll be back before you soon. We'll actually have a hearing to um, to to present some more firm ideas on on moving forward. Yeah. So we're not continuing a work session. We sure. are. Yeah, we should. We should continue. continue? Yeah, okay. that, that that would be good. All right, so unless there are any other issues or questions, I will entertain a motion to continue this work session. To move. Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. And I'll check with John Aye. and Reagan. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Yeah. Okay. So our next worst session is requested by Working Stiff Properties LLC, owner for a property located at 92 Pleasant Street, wherein permission is requested to allow renovations to an existing structure, replace windows and storm windows, construct an iron balcony, and replace two windows with balcony doors. As per plans on file in the planning department, said property is located is shown on assessor map 107 as lot 76 and lies within the character district 4 downtown overlay and historic districts hello hi, hi. good evening good evening if you'd like to introduce yourselves so we can get started i'm matthew bb i'm a member of working stiff properties <laughs> <laughs> i'm part of virginia i'm the other member <laughs> well Do you want me to start? Okay, yeah. Okay. I can give you guys a sort of a brief summary of what we're hoping to accomplish. Um, but we thought it would be a good idea to have a work session because there's a lot happening on this block. And, uh, well, there's a lot not happening. <laughs> well, we uh, there. hopefully soon there'll be more happening. But we've been, uh, we hadn't owned it for very long before the fire took most of the rest of the block. And We've been sort of waiting and hoping to maybe do some of this collaboratively with the Floros project, but <clears throat> we're not sure when that's going to start. So we're hoping to sort of get going on the things that we uh, would like to do and envision, um, you know, restoring and repairing the building, a portion of the building where we own. So, uh, well, because in general, because the description is of this balcony, focus mo mostly on the balcony, but the idea is to restore the exterior of the whole building. And Matt can yeah, to the limits yeah. that we own. Yeah. So, um, I mean, most of you are probably familiar with um, the the benchmark of our portion of the building was the clip joint at one point for many, many <laughs> years. And they've since moved um, on into their second location at this point. Um, and so that portion of the building, we don't have a, an awful lot uh, planned for at the moment with that sort of more modern uh, entry. But um, I wrote down a few goals in no particular order that some of the things that we're hoping to accomplish uh, in the very near future would certainly be to increase the energy efficiency. And that's sort of wrapped up in the overall um, restoration. Um, we plan to preserve and restore as much of the original architectural features as possible. So there's a lot of cool things that we think that are underneath the two layers or the <laughs> layer of aluminum siding and then mm -hmm. The layer beneath that would be the original um, wood siding. Um, and we've peeled a little bit of the aluminum back to see some of the things. So we're kind of excited about what's there and, and hope to bring all that back. Um, one of the main things on our application tonight is to discuss uh, and open a discourse about the replacement or repair of the windows. Um, Barbara and I both have some very strong opinions on how we'd like that to go, but we certainly want to hear uh, from the board on that. Um, we, um, a couple of minor things, we have this sort of ugly service entrance on the back of the building with multiple meters. Have that up on the yeah, we're hoping yeah. to, uh, we're hoping to clean that up. I had a meeting scheduled with Eversource this morning and they conveniently forgot to show up. Mm. So I have nothing that I can add to that at the moment. But uh, we're rescheduled for tomorrow, so we're hoping that um, there's some things that we can do there to to maybe pretty that up a little bit, or well, at to least move it. or to put it so in a more smack dab in the middle of that. Put it in a more discreet yeah. location, right? Um, and then uh, probably the major ask on our application is to be able to convert a couple of on that same facade, those two upper windows on the right hand side. Uh -huh. We were hoping to convert yeah. those to balcony doors and have a small Victorian-like uh, wrought iron 
combination, iron and wood mm -hmm. balcony. Mm -hmm. um, maybe pulling the idea of the same corbels that are up underneath the, it's hard to see in this yeah, view, but they're the green yeah. corbels that are above the second story windows at the eave and below the dormers. Um, a version of that design underneath the balcony to pull those elements together. Um, so a brief overview on the windows, and we did have a site visit with Nick. He was kind enough to come out and we talked about a bunch of things here. So there's six dormers on our portion of the building. <coughs> Each of those windows is an 80s or so version, replacement version. The old Rivco window company that used to be in Pennacook, they're, and they are falling apart. So uh, our proposal would be to remove those and replace those with new construction Green Mountain windows, so they would have traditional five-quarter trim, um, thick two-inch. We would have they would be painted, of course, but we would use mahogany sills to help preserve against rot, so that those could last hopefully a hundred years or so, which the Rivco certainly have not been able to accomplish. Um, and then uh, the and actually and that's on both sides, right? There's three yes. dormer windows on the front. On right. The so there's a, there's six total, right? And then um, disregarding the two windows we're, we're asking about the balcony doors the remainder of the windows our choice would be to replace those with Green Mountain windows that are the sash and balance replacement types which means it's not a full box replacement window it's just the sash and they have make a beautiful concealed balance so you can't really see, it doesn't look like the vinyl or the aluminum balances that you would see in a traditional replacement window. I think it's what they used in one of the buildings across the street from us. Yeah. Nick, are you? A few you, people have used it here. Yeah. Before so I'm sure you guys are familiar with it, but the the other option, of course, would be, and we've spoken to Luca Selabek, who's done a bunch of restoration downtown, would be to restore each window individually, um, remove the storms, and then replace the storms because the, the, the restored sash would only be single strength glass and that would definitely not be within our hopes for energy efficiency, and I'm sure the inspection department would frown on us <laughs> putting single-strength glass back in this building. So, Or aesthetics. Yeah. yeah. So we, we discussed you know, the pros and cons of um, restoring the windows and then you know, getting new storms on the outside um, and just versus getting these very high-quality replacement windows that are, you know, have the... Mo the, the mutton bars, the mutton bars. traditional with um, mutton bars. Yeah. And you know, as I and I sent Nick a bunch of pictures this afternoon as I walk through town, I think the you know restorations where there's newer windows with no storm windows and no screens um, look far better and um, than uh, restorations where there's a storm on the outside. Um, you know, where you get just one giant reflection um, and you've got usually these aluminum storms. Um, so I think for us, you know, aesthetically and, you know, functionally, the replacement windows are the way to go. There's no, uh, <clears throat> currently, to our knowledge, except for the roof at the third floor level, which had been changed at some point about 20 years ago, the ceiling, I should say, underneath the roof at the third floor level, uh, the other three main facades of the house, there's no insulation in the walls. So our proposal would be to take off all the aluminum. We'd like to evaluate the pine clapboard siding underneath. Um, if it's not in terrible shape, we might consider restoring that. So scraping and painting and keeping it. But we <coughs> would like to, you know, the, we want to blow in insulation, a like mineral wool insulation or the equivalent, and do that from the outside, which would mean removing clapboards. Drill, you guys are familiar with the process. So it's a little bit painstaking. My concern about the old pine clabbered siding, of course, is that when they put it on back in the 1800s, they didn't know how to back prime the wood then. So it's bare wood on the, on the backside. It's painted on the face. And the reason it has aluminum siding on it now is I'm sure the previous owners got tired of repainting every two or three years. So the solution would be to tear all of it off. And it's loaded with lead paint. So I have a contractor who would do that so we can comply with you know the removal of lead um, on structures laws 
and we would replace it with, um, and I've got a sample here actually of what we used on our own house, but there are a couple of companies still in New England that are producing, you know, like a traditional, I can pass these around. So here's an example of a cedar clapboard, which I'm sure everyone's seen, and you'll notice that it has a sort of rounded eased edge. And then this is produced by a company called the Ward Clapboard Mill. So this is spruce, which I've used, but we would use pine. Um, it comes in shorter lengths, which they came in shorter lengths back in the old days. You didn't have 16 foot runs of, mm. of this. And this has that sharp cut detail. So you can pass that around. We would, if we had to replace the siding, which I'm assuming we'll have to do, we would use this type of siding. So it's a clear vertical grain. It's a, it's a cool old timey that uh, it cuts the clapboards. It spins the log and cuts the clapboards radially. So And I'm sure other people are using, well, maybe some others have used this, but we redid our entire house at 81 Lincoln Avenue with these, which is just down the street. So I know it, you don't have an awful lot of spare time to drive around and look at properties, but if you wanted to see what it looks like, we actually went, I'm not sure I can do it here, but we went so far in our house as to actually set the nails and fill the holes and sand it like they did back in the old days. So none of the nail heads were exposed either, which was, it looks great, but. Took a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, and okay, then one of so the other things we'd like to do, and um, if you, th I, I don't think you can really see them in the one historic photo that's in this file. I have another photo from the Athenaeum from the other direction uh, where you can see the little feet under the windowsills or little corbels. Um, and again, I have other photos from around town um, of, you know, there's a few buildings on Court Street that have those little mini corbels under the sills. So I would like to replace those, and I think we're in, <laughs> we're in agreement about right. that to get that look back. Um, um, and then there's also a question where, um, again, the other photo that I have, you can kind of see them. The, on the gable end, the third floor windows, there's two floor windows. It looks like from the inside that they might have been yeah. curved, actually, at the top. Um, and so once we get the siding off and we can really see, um, we've gotten an estimate for, you know, um, the replacement windows to actually restore that, to have the curved. And we don't know, you know, if they would have, if it would have just been that smooth curve, it would have had that little uh, key in the middle um, or not. Um, not but, for the outside case. Yeah, so, we we yeah. can't see it until we pull yeah. off the aluminum, yeah. but it, it may have a key in the yeah. head casing so we'll see but uh, so i didn't do it justice in my mm -hmm. elevation mm -hmm. of that gable end because i didn't realize until after we went up and took some closer measurements that it actually is the the original frame of the window has a curved top and when they did their rivco replacement windows they just cut on a bandsaw okay. a little mm -hmm. a little crescent <laughs> and nailed it to the top right. of an existing window so yeah. it would make contact yeah. and not have air moving but we would we talked to Green Mountain and had them actually estimate to build the window with the proper radius curve on the top of the upper sash. So, which I think would look really that'd be cool. Really <coughs> nice yeah. little, a nice little detail coming up yeah. Pleasant Street if you see that gable line. And then, do you want to speak about the addition of the porch? Yes, so the balcony thing? is the biggest, I think, change. You know, everything else is really restoring. We're trying to restore what once was. Um, and this is just adding um, some sort of fun functionality. So when <laughs> we live there, um, you know, that side faces, you know, west, southwest. Um, so lovely to step out and watch the fireworks and have morning coffee or an evening cocktail. Um, just thought that would be lovely. And I have little visions of being in Paris, which is, you know, whatever. But um, <laughs> so that idea of being able to, you know, open up uh, these doors and, and have a little outside space, even in that little bit of pavement paradise out there yeah that yeah. as you probably all know that's the facade that faces the five space parking lot where all the clip joint folks used to park mm -hmm. and that little cross section of the small one-story piece is that one-story piece that uh, the clip joint had added on like I don't know mm -hmm. like maybe 20 years ago so that little years L ago. on the side yeah so and we we do want to at some point bring that up to the same <clears throat> level, meaning we would replace those windows and replace the siding. It has hardy siding on it right now, which is falling apart. It looks terrible, but 
we're sort of waiting to see what the Floros project does with that wing wall because I'd hate to rebuild that and then if they get into demolition and that CMU wall collapses and crushes our work, mm. that would be a little disappointing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we're, I think we're going to put that in our back pocket for the time being. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so we looked at a lot of designs of balconies and it just seemed um, that, you know, repeating in a way the corbels that are up on the eave uh, underneath the balcony to support. Um, and then um, using a wrought iron design. I talked to Peter Hatney about, I showed him pictures um, from the um, Frank, um, oh, Frank Jones, Frank Jones yeah. mansion. And, he, and if you've ever been to Peter's shop, it's wonderful. He's like, I, I used to have a bunch of that. It used to go around the whole top of it. So we dug and he thought he got rid of, rid of it. But um, there's still a portion above like a bay. I don't know what you, that sort of juts out. Um, and he thought for sure that he could take that design um, and sort of stretch it out and fill it in and make it to code uh, with a railing and sort of use that, the Frank Jones wrought iron as inspiration. Um, just so we're not kind of making it up, you know? I mean, there, I have, again, some samples that I sent Nick you know, on um, Islington Street. It's, a, it's one of those clubs, it's not a club. Um, you know, like the, not the Masons, but it's on Islington, kind of across from the mobile station, um, up at the end of Pearl Street. And they have a little wrought iron above their door entrance, but it's like harps or something, lutes or something. <laughs> I don't, you know, so, um, you know, looking around to try to get inspiration from local buildings, um, you know, not making it up from my Parisian dream. Um, so there's some sort of New England reference there um, and using that. So he thought that could be done for sure. All right, any questions or comments from the commission? John Can I start Reagan? out? Yes, John. Yeah, uh, there was a piece of that uh, iron railing from the mansion, the governor's mansion that was on Woodbury Avenue where uh, Portsmouth Housing has all of their little cottages and um, mm -hmm. that had balconies with iron railings um, around them. So I guess uh, the only thing I can say about your plan is the devils are definitely in the details because uh, I don't think any of us wants to see this so-called Romeo and Juliet type of things anymore, <laughs> especially on a historic structure. Um, I would prefer that you leave the six over six windows personally myself. And I would also urge you to consider changing the old clip joint storefront which I remember it as Al's the Barbershop. <laughs> Anyways, it's been there a long time. And, um, you know, if you wanted to change it in conjunction with what Floros is doing, that would be great. Um, I think you probably have to. Um, otherwise, I, I, I think your plans are good and well thought out. You know what you're up against. And um, so good luck to you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. If you don't mind, how you control like half of this building? Yes. What happens to the other half? Well, that's an excellent question. In fact, while the last uh, work session was going on, I went back to review the plans that Michael Keane did for the Floros building to see what he had specified. And I think that it's gone through, Nick, if I'm not, Incorrect, hasn't it gone through all HDC approvals? It's been yeah. vetted, right? So he doesn't give an awful lot of detail uh, on that facade. He just says, uh, when did I wrote it down? It said, new painted wood clapboards match existing exposure. So my question, uh, we came to some of those hearings. I don't know why I didn't ask this then, but my question would have been, well, the way it's, it looks in the photos now, it's all aluminum siding. So that's a fixed four inch coursing. It never changes. Right, and it just gets cut around the window. How, sure. Wherever they start, that's where the four inch coursing starts. Sure. So, and that's not how clapboarding was done. That's exactly right. So an existing, so like I would encourage them and I'm hoping what really we'd be sort of mentoring what they do. If we do our building traditionally so that the clapboards line up with the sills and line up with the window tops, we're gonna come to that point where it's halfway. I think that he showed in his plan a vertical board to separate the two, it's not, clearly noted or called out. That wouldn't be my first choice. My first choice would be to break our clapboards back with small pieces and, you know, um, and variable, not just, you know, every other one being 
distinct so that they could weave, because the whole window should all line up. They could weave their clapboards back into ours, but then you've got the issue of what do we do where the building is divided if we choose one color and they choose another. So this is a, it's an excellent question. I don't really know the best answer No, for well, it. you can even see, again, I, we don't have the, the other historic photo here. You can see that they were different colors even then, the townhomes, so that's well, So what we've got yet. is, you actually have no plan whatsoever. And, and we don't know what Peter's really going to do. Yeah, we have our plan and he has his plan. And go. how do we, that's, that's why we're that's, saying. That's a, that's a tough one to yeah. face I was from hoping. this side of the bench if you want to know. But yeah, 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 I'm sure it's difficult on your side too. Right. So the, uh, wow. We're not even certain that we're going to have a unified paint scheme to the building. We actually have no real way of. Nope. Making that really happen. Paint. Painting is not in our purview. Fascinating. Thank you very much. No, and again, historically, they were different colors. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, all runs of clabbered, but different colors. Interesting. So, yeah. I had no idea what they're planning to do with those old solar panels and the. Those are ours. Those are yeah. those yeah. are ours. Yeah, yeah. we came oh, before the board. Yeah, right, right yeah. at the Flip beginning through. of our ownership to. Okay. Yeah. Which is why, you know, the thought is if we can get the electric, what do you call that? The electrical? Oh, the service entrance. The service entrance gets all, if it can go underground and the meters are on the corner or if it can be just moved over. So all the mechanical muckety-muck is sort of in that area, you know, over the L and by the L. And then there's some sort of trellis or something. Yeah, you I know? think in a perfect world, um, we try to, to get it. it to the left of the entrance, mm -hmm. the back door mm -hmm. entrance because then you could have some plantings in there that mm -hmm. kind of screen it a little bit. Yeah. But I don't know that in this instance, like we're experienced with screening the mechanical stuff, it's not screened on the, the existing stuff that's on the building, it's on that single story building. You can see, I've noted it, there's a couple of condensers up there now mm -hmm. that are just open yeah. to public view. Mm -hmm. Now, if we, we don't have it planned for this particular renovation, but we would like to probably add some more air conditioning to the building at some point. We'd probably want to take advantage of the same location to put the condensers or down on the ground behind that door in a way that we can screen it, but we probably want to screen it in either case. I just don't know. I've never screened something on a rooftop before, so I don't mm -hmm. know how we would address that. Rich? Thank you. Um, yes, I wasn't here when they approved obviously the floral side of this building is it um would i be guessing correctly if they did the vertical to separate it because of we don't have any purview over paint or anything and that would you know kind of mimic what looks around town where buildings were kind of separated at different times or um you can distinctly see the two different properties in the same building yeah i think it's also i, I see that dan has the the drawing there 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 are corner boards in other parts of the building and so i think there was some mimicking going on okay yeah there's a unique and it doesn't travel all the way around the back i noted that in this elevation but there is a unique horizontal band that sort of divides the building horizontally yeah. almost in half the that front. they recreated with the aluminum they just did you know some uh, coil stock and folded it around it so I guess my only concern would be if we, can, if we do a vertical board on the front, which I think is a good way to delineate it, but how is that going to look if we restore that horizontal band? You know, do we cut through it? Do we just come down on top of it, top and bottom, and then I guess we paint that vertical piece the same color as the clapboard to try to get it to recede into the background? This is showing um, up today. So I don't know. I mean, I, yeah. well, I'm looking for some advice, I guess. So. <laughs> Karen? A lot of different voices yeah, here. I just have a question. Um, sure. Uh, the bulkhead goes away, and that's just a, a hatch now. Is that right? Am I no, the, the bulkhead actually is, um, I mean, it may end up needing a little bit of additional this restoration in the future. Right, it's, 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 okay, so that concrete. still is a bulkhead. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah I actually fixed those right. doors yeah. up a little this bit a little while ago. Maybe. Just yeah. made it, you know, it was like a replacement in kind. It's the same beaded board and all that. I saw like a trim below that. I didn't know if that was a hatch or it was a, it's still a bulkhead. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Martin. Uh, I think you're proposing some really great things with this building. It's terrific to see you want to bring back the, the clapboards and uh, I assume the, the Green Mountain are going to be replacement sashes. That's all wonderful stuff. Take away the, the storm windows again. 
terrific. I applaud that. Um, I hate that destroy people's dreams, but I'm, I don't know if I can support the balcony. Um, okay. I take that money that you would put into the balcony and go to France. I mean, <laughs> um, it's just a one I mean, stop, though. Much. <laughs> the one off. <laughs> it's it, it would be a, it would be not appropriate for this house, or style wise. It's and I hate doing this. I hate telling you that because you know I would love to have a balcony off in of my house as well, but. Um, it would have to be a, a 42 inch rail and it, it just wouldn't be appropriate for this um, for this house for this addition everything else you're doing is fantastic I wouldn't wait for the other owner no. lead it uh, you, you know you do what's appropriate for your block of the building and they'll follow eventually as long as you do it right um, so I applaud you and I'm sorry <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I respectfully disagree. I mean, the, 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 I mean, it's the back of the building. Um, you know, we're going to be restoring everything else and, 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 and bringing back all these details and charms to the building. So I feel like you know, adding some, you know, fun functionality to this back of the building where it is this horrible cinder block wall on the, flora, on the floros back part. Um, it's pavement. It's... You know, we do have mechanicals and solar panels, right? So it's not the prettiest side of the building anyway. It was sort of the excuse why the HDC gave us the solar panels to begin with. It was sort of ugly back there I wasn't already. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, and that cinder block wall, Floros plans to keep it. Um, so, you know, so then I may as well have a lovely balcony to sit on and, and watch the sunset and have a cocktail. Is how it was sort of yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that all yeah. sounds terrific, yeah. but I, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we could get Wyland to come back and paint the whale on the CMU wall. That's no, I, yeah, no, we, down we had thoughts about that. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Could I jump in at all? Yes, Reagan. I don't want to interrupt anybody else. I can't see no. who's getting ready to speak or anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I just I wanted to echo Martin's comments. This is a really um, great step forward you're taking with this building, and I agree. Lead it, do it right, so that um, whatever the rest of the building has to do, hopefully they can match what you do. And if they have to come back before us to kind of tweak their design a little bit in order to match, great. Um, so I I think that's all wonderful. The the windows. Um, I mean, we really want to always encourage the retention of historic windows. Um, and even the Green Mountain replacements, sash, sound great, all that stuff, but they just, if they're, they just won't last as long as the historic windows have already lasted and will last if they're restored and done properly. Um, I totally understand the energy efficiency um, issue. There are also much better looking storm windows out there than what you have. <laughs> um, and, and I, I also am having trouble with the balcony and the windows. Um, if, if you could bring us any, um, examples of similar things on a similar type of building anywhere in our historic district, maybe that would might sway me, but I can't think of any. We have approved a lot of balconies on new construction because it's more appropriate to a building being constructed today um, in certain parts of the city. But even though this is the back of the building, it's still so highly visible. I mean, you're right on Court Street. It may as well be another front of the building, no matter how ugly and junky it is with all the utilities. Um, you're not hidden. A lot of times we we talk about back of the building and give it a little bit more sort of leeway, but that's generally with the assumption that you can't see the back of the building. So, um, so yeah, I, I'm going to have trouble accepting these the uh, 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 ornate sort of wrought iron balcony on this type of building. Um, that being said, though, on the on the front and the rest of it, I really applaud your work to bring it back up. Um, I can't wait to yeah. see what you peel back from the aluminum siding. And um, yeah, no, thank you for taking care of this building. Okay. 
I was just going to echo what uh, Reagan's saying. Although it's the back of the building, it is very visible across street, uh, from uh, Court Street. And right across from you are two buildings that they've done a wonderful job restoring. And hopefully someday down the street, the old firehouse or the old Baker and Wright is going to go back to the, uh, to the way it used to be. So the, the opposite side of the street on a very important street in town uh, has, has done a great job, and I'm not sure the balcony fits in with all that. Okay. I'm going to ask if anyone from the public would like to speak to this work session. Nobody online. Sorry. Nobody has their hand okay. up. Okay. Very good. <laughs> all right. So um, I think what the consensus I'm hearing is that the balconies are balconies an issue, mm -hmm. um, and you're welcome to try again with something, either that is a different configuration, or you can demonstrate something that's happened in the historic district before that's appropriate for this building. A lot of kudos for your plans to restore and bring back some of the old features. Um, taking a look at restoring the older windows if possible. Um, and I think we would also be interested to know if, if you can peel back a little bit just what it is you're going to be finding underneath there. Yeah, and especially for those curved windows. Okay. I think, you know, um, so I guess we have to think if we want to do another work session or not. But I, you know, I, I already said um, we had the conversation when we talked about restoring versus replacing. And I will dig in to the replacing. Um, uh, again, because of uh, the efficiency, but also because I think it looks better. Um, and I took a lot of pictures of houses in the south end uh, with the replacement windows with no storm. Um, and I have pictures of, uh, you know, restored windows with new fancy storms. And those don't look good. You have one giant reflection. It's a waste to even have all the divided lights because you can't see them behind the storms. And then having the you know, even if you just have a half screen, we won't have any screens. We're going to do the little pull down screens on the inside so you won't have any screens. So um, I really think it looks so much better. Um, we can certainly clean, we can get to the windows and clean and maintain them actually a lot easier without storms um, over restored windows. So I will be digging on, on that one for sure. Um, so. Um, Okay. Well, I think Just, it's, yeah. it's important to mm -hmm. note, too, that um, regarding the two buildings across the street that have been restored so lovingly, mm -hmm. the pumpkin house has restored windows with storms, and the next house over has all Green Mountain replacement sash and balances. So you can actually stand with your back up against our gable end and see both of those at the mm -hmm. same time, and then consider, you know, mm -hmm. what would it be that great of a difference if we used the replacement window here but uh, you know as a builder who's now being forced by code to try to build new construction to a point of air changes per hour which you know I couldn't get w w one room of this place to meet the current code but each one of those windows has a pocket about that wide and about that deep that's got nothing in it but window weights and that's just cold air going out all the time so there's ways for us to mitigate that a little bit on the outside, but we can never get it the same as if we replace that sash and fill that with blown in insulation. So, you know, I, I too, am, you know, I appreciate the restoration idea of the window. We went through the exercise of meeting with someone and the pricing is not outrageously different, mm -hmm. um, but it is an aesthetic for us that I, I think it would look better to have the Green Mountains. So, but I mean, ultimately we'd be left up to the commission to vote. Okay, so desire is to continue the work session, or do you want to close the work session and I would try say if, if you really I want to go... I would say do one more work session, see if I can convince you about a balcony. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, and Heinz, we'll try that with more images. Yep. Heinz, did you have a comment? Mm -hmm. oh, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. Could I had take one more whack at it? Just mm -hmm. a crazy idea? Mm -hmm. um, I think possibly what might be more acceptable is if you created a door coming out onto that low roof that is was part of that addition and left the uh, you know you coming off the bedroom I see in plan possibly for a balcony I don't know if that's acceptable to the board but to, or me to build a walkway on the roof of that uh, one-story addition yeah potentially 
a porch up there. We have solar. Okay. That's where all the solar stuff is. Right. I'd have to go. Away. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's two, there's two, anyway. yeah. there's, there's two yeah. parts to that. Yeah, the second part yeah. is that that window actually belongs to the apartment that's beside here. The second floor is divided into mm -hmm. half yeah. a yeah. unit that goes to the yeah. third floor, yeah. and the other is a so fully redone apartment. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she's going to raise her hand now. For like she's going to be trying to get you to Paris. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good plan. I, I, Marco, should yeah. I make a motion? Yes. To so, continue um, this work yeah. session? Yeah. 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 Is yes. that a motion, John? Yes, it is. The next month. Seconded? Yeah. Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. John Aye. and Reagan? Aye. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks so, so much, much for your time. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. There's an iron balcony on Siri Street. Thank you. Yes, there I'm is. I'm going to find it. It's a brick building. Right. Yeah. But Oh, it's something you might want to look at. Okay, a work session requested by One Market Square LLC, owner for property located at One Congress Street, wherein permission is requested to allow renovations to an existing structure, repair and upgrade building facades along Congress and High Streets, and new construction to an existing structure, replace rear shed additions with new four to five story addition. As per plans on file in the planning department, said property is shown at Cessor Map 117 as lot 14 and lies within the character district 5, downtown overlay, and historic districts. Tracy, hi. Good evening. Why don't you introduce yourselves and I'll let uh, you take Tracy over. Tracy Kozak, I'm an ARCO of Architects tonight, and with Mark McNabb from McNabb Properties and One Market Square LLC. Thank you for having us. This is our first work session. We're here to talk about context and massing, the first of our four step work session process. I'm sure you're all familiar with this building. It's the corner of High Street and Congress Street directly across from the North Church. Uh, it's recently known as the Jarvis Block, before that the Fay Block. Uh, it's the home to Opal and Oak and uh, the Rudy's Restaurant was there. Um, one thing you should know is that this is, uh, as, as of, I guess, Friday, two, was two parcels, lot 14 and 15, which is, uh, as of a couple of days ago or yesterday, today maybe, <laughs> merged. So it's all one lot now. So a lot of what we have on the front page with uh, the two different lots in CD4, CD5, um, we believe goes away because it's now all one lot. Uh, the context <coughs> maps are on the next page, um, showing where the the parcel is located. It's it's a really fascinating site in terms of urban wayfinding, and this is one of the major themes we're looking at: is to create connections between major and minor but interesting public spaces throughout the city. Uh, so we have um, Lad Street, which comes in from the south and High Street, and then there's the parking garage. Uh, Ladd Street, as you know, continues across Market Street, connecting to Commercial Alley, and then the McIntyre. And if you continue Ladd Street past High Street, it becomes Haven Court, which is a private uh, easement. It's a private right-of-way. But visually, it connects all the way to Fleet Street. And so a, a major goal of this project is to improve Haven Court with public access to link Commercial Alley to Fleet Street and really begin to connect the city. Um, let's see, the next page. This is the existing building, as you see. It's actually two buildings. One Congress is at the corner. It's the brick, um, Gothic Romanesque <laughs> building. And then to the left of it is the white painted brick building. That's three Congress Street above Rudy's. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the development of these buildings as we get into the next pages. As you turn down High Street, there's a uh, pink and white painted wood building behind the brick building. And uh, that is a really unique building as well. All of these buildings have some f fabulous, ornate, and very unique detailing that you don't find really anywhere else. It's, it's fun. There's a lot of fun stuff. And then, of course, there's a parking lot in back. 
surface parking lot. The next page, uh, O.3, these are the street panoramas, the context around the area. The top left picture is really the most important one, and I brought some enlarged views of, of these images. That, that picture is iconic to Portsmouth. It's looking down High Street from Ladd uh, at the North Steeple. And uh, as you know, the North Steeple kind of defines our town. Uh, it's, it's the center, the epicenter of downtown is oops, this giant steeple. And so many people um, are delightfully surprised when they wander down Commercial Alley, and some of them might find their way down Ladd Street, and they turn and they look to the left, and they see this steeple that's framed by this little street, and it's just, it dominates the whole street. It's incredible, and, and it's just, I think, one of the most powerful features of this, this entire block is maybe not the building itself, but, but what's happening around the building. So it's just one of those delightful surprises that people get when they're wandering around the city. And that's happening here. Um, the other contextual uh, buildings on this page, we have some of the uh, surprises down Ladd Street. The, there's that wonderful courtyard behind the Athenaeum that has the spiral staircases and fire escapes and that, that um, kind of hidden cloister that you come upon. Uh, we have a variety of, of buildings up around Market Square and Pleasant Street. Um, most of them are four stories. We have some at four and a half, uh, three and a half. Um, most of them are brick. <laughs> we have some granite. Uh, this building on the corner um, of High and Congress is mostly brick, but it actually has some brownstone on it as well and some <coughs> terracotta, which is pretty cool. The next page, uh, 0 0.4 are the historic photos. The building on the corner, the brick building at One Congress, uh, that came about in um, around 1890, I guess, 1900. But before that, there was a three-story wood clapboard um, how, uh, commercial structure that came down in the late 1800s and was replaced. The existing building to the left of that uh, was there a little bit earlier. It has some coining on the sides. A lot of that original detail has been lost. We would like to restore the missing pieces on that building. And likewise, on the uh, one Congress, the brick building on the corner, the original storefront has, has also been lost. We'd like to restore that. You can see the original behind the pony on the bottom right. <laughs> there's a little pony cart saying, um, uh, give, donate your money to the U.S. war, or something like that. <laughs> it was a bank originally. And uh, it, the, it had a really um, beautiful, it looks like a granite um, rusticated base that framed a symmetrical uh, cast iron storefront. Uh, that was lost in the 1950s or 40s for a very modern brick and aluminum thing. So we want to restore that. And then la likewise, uh, that pink and white wood building on High Street with the shallow arch, um, we, it had a variety of uses. Uh, looking at the Sanborn maps in the past, it, it was a bank and a barbershop, but one of the maps I found said it was an opera house. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a really special building. It's very formal uh, with the arch, and there's so much ornate carving on the window surrounds. It's very unusual. It's, it's quite beautiful. It needs a little maintenance, but uh, it could be restored. And there also was originally a very formal uh, entrance <coughs> on the first floor, which has now been lost. But again, we'd like to restore that. Haven't found a really clear picture of what that used to be. We have just this oblique shot, but we're going to try to um, uncover what that was and restore that as a uh, main entrance to the uh, area. I won't read all of the next page, but there is a history narrative uh, on the site. And one of the interesting things we discovered is that in what is now the surface parking lot behind Rudy's, that used to be a, um, a hotel. It was called the Dolphin Hotel. And for those of you that were here in the 60s or earlier, you may remember it was there. It burned down in 1969. Uh, before 
it was known as the Dolphin. It was known as the National Hotel. And I, uh, in the newspaper article, uh, the day after it burned down, it simply alluded to a hotel with a very colorful history. And I haven't been able to figure out what that colorful history is, but it, it was a, a pretty big structure um, for 100 or 150 years or so. Um, we'd like to put another structure back where that building was. The next page is the existing survey, and you can see the parking lot I just mentioned, High Street, um, Haven Court towards the back, towards the north. It's a relatively flat site. And the next page shows um, basically building out a majority of the parking lot and, and restoring and renovating the existing buildings. Uh, maintaining the public easeway on Haven Court to the north for uh, public access and connections, as I mentioned, between Commercial Alley and Fleet Street. And uh, the next pages are just showing to continue the existing height that we have on the front buildings across the back. Uh, haven't gotten into design yet, but <coughs> some of the things, I just brought some photos. Um, most of these are already in here small, but some of the things we found really compelling and unique about this site are things that we want to make sure we emphasize so that the addition tells the story of what we're adding onto. Uh, this is not a freestanding building, so the connection to the existing is really important. And the um, anchoring this as this addition as a wayfinding element of itself in that sequence of traveling commercial alley to Flea Street. How does this building help people find their way? And how does it how does it encourage them to turn left and look at the steeple and, and find their way by placing these landmarks and connecting the dots? Um, one of the <coughs> interesting things um, I noticed uh, in looking at this building, a lot of people say, what's up with that roof, that, that weird skylight on the top? Do you, know, you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. that <laughs> with the four large lights yeah, of glass. It's yes. on, here it is. So it's on the mansard roof, got these these windows and, and like you don't really see that a lot in Portsmouth. So as it turns out, this building has been a long home to a sequence of photographers and print print shops, print book binders and printmakers. This was a photography studio, I'm told. Um, they needed the light for the studio. They also had a dark room, presumably, and and it, it just seems like that's there's, there's this real difference between light and dark also. When you look at the front of the building, you have the very beautiful but heavy brick corbeling. You have the carved, uh, the carved terracotta. Um, there's a here. Check this. Isn't this amazing? There's this carved terracotta medallion. You've got the the brick patterning and the the brownstone keystones. It's really rich. Uh, it's great. It's very heavy. And you also notice the medallion of the terracotta flower is closed here. So it, the building is closed. It's heavy facing uh, Market Street. But then you turn the corner, and they've covered it with fire escapes and ladders <coughs> and uh, all sorts of things. And then you still have the terracotta details on the top, but the flowers are now open. And you have the skylight. So the building, as you turn the corner, goes from kind of solid and dark to open and light as you're turning the corner. Um, at the same time, we are under the wa careful watch of the clock tower and the steeple. So it just seems that there's a lot going on here with um, how the building faces Market Square versus the smaller high street between the, um, the open and closed, the light and dark, the, uh, the iconic clock tower and, and the bells. And how, how, does, how does this all tie into what might become an addition that that tells that story. Um, that's pretty much all we have. <laughs> so we have a bunch of images. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. This is the lamppost on High Street with the fire escapes in the back, and it's reflecting the clock tower. So, it, and most people don't notice this when they walk by, but there's all sorts of little signs in the shadows and, and the reflections in the windows that give a cue to like a landmark that's beyond, like like 
you might not realize that steeple's there, but subconsciously you've seen this and you know that steeple's coming and you want to go around the corner. You don't know why, but you know there's something there. So that's kind of the, the magic of discovering Portsmouth is turning these corners and having these secret hidden cues. And we want to play on that and make it really fun and invite people to come here and activate the space. Um, that's it. <laughs> Looking forward to your feedback. Okay. Um couple of things, if, if you don't mind, I start right in. Um, there's a wacky window in the three-story wooden addition that was once there in the eight, late 1800s on the third floor of that. Yeah, this What's one. It, so this is like a, maybe this is a cry for, for, for lighting. I was hoping you might know what that was. Yeah, no, I wish I did. Um, I can't even make anything up, and I'm usually good at that. Um, <laughs> two questions. Uh, one, it seems like that, that little Italianate uh, theater building, um, it seems like you're going to cramp yourself by trying to connect to that. How do you handle, I mean, how do you envision yeah. that happening? That, you know, that corner of that building, um, there, I believe there used to be a little alleyway right back there before the Dolphin Hotel. And you can sort of see it uh, here, <laughs> I guess. Sure. So, and, and you can just tell by looking at the way those coin blocks turn the corner, that, that corner was a freestanding corner. Oh, I see. So whatever connects there, um, I would imagine it needs to be You're pushed, pushed back, back and recedes so that you perceive that break. Next question, which is, Similar question, but around the, the side, there's a. I'm gonna. I, pardon me for failing at this thing, but the next building that you don't own down the <coughs> block is a one-story building that looks like a two-story building. What are you gonna do with the roof of that? Yes. That one yeah, hurt. we get bagels there these days. Um, that used to be. That burned down. That's not how it was. There are older pictures that are different. Um, okay, but how it is now? It's, it's a one. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's virtually a one-story yeah. roof. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because um, there's a real imbalance to that uh, street front. Well, Preston's is not there anymore, but sure. um, even this one Congress to three Congress, where you have this really like elaborate um, look at me kind of roof on one Congress, and then. Poor little three Congress. It's just this flat thing, and you have this giant firewall. It's like it, it's, it looks like something came down um, at some point. Because why would they build this giant firewall? So um, we, we'd like to consider maybe um, trying to balance that with perhaps a dormer or, or something, some feature on the roof of one Congress to help tie that together. Three Congress. Three Congress. Yeah, because all you see on three Congress is just an asphalt shingle, sloped roof, and then that big firewall to the one Congress. And it's like something's missing there. Another great one of the uh, high street. Uh, yeah, there's some pictures and of the two. Well, that one has it pretty much. Other questions, comments? Um, Rich? Yes, thank you. Um, my only worries here, I'm conceding, and I'm very familiar, obviously, with um, Haven Court. Uh, that's how me and my friends used to get to Gillies. And, um, <laughs> but putting up a big building next to that parking garage, that could, that's going to be a very dark alleyway. Um, you know, I mean, right now it's yeah. it's obviously it's blocked off. It's not used. You know, I mean, it's only the young kids that jump over those barriers and actually <laughs> use it. Um, my only fear was that 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 would be become because one side of it's already a parking garage. You know what I mean? Which isn't be the most attractive place to hang out at late at night or something. Um, but then we'd be creating this very auspicious area in the middle of town. You know, um, very very dark, very you know unfriendly alleyway kind of thing. That, that, that's what I wouldn't want to. Um, you know, like I, I, I love like commerciality, you know, there's lots of, we've done it nicely, a lot of areas of town where there are small alleyways, we make it attractive, we make it inviting, you know what I mean, keep it well lit and that kind of thing. Um, That's yeah, exactly that would, that would what we would yeah. look to be doing uh, here is using, it would be landscaped and hardscaped extensively with a lot of plantings and sculptures and there would be um, overhead lighting 
uh, and well illuminated. We're holding back oh, yeah. off of the face of the garage by uh, about um, 15, 15 feet, 20 feet. 20 uh, feet. Wait, don't quote me on that. I have it. <laughs> it's not 10 foot. A one, or it's uh, no, 10 it's feet from 10. the center line of okay. the alley. Right. And the center line of the alley is like 10 feet from the garage. So I think the overall is like 19 or 20 feet. Yeah, yeah it's, it's closer to 20 than yeah. than 10. It's yeah. certainly a lot bigger than commercial alley. Yeah. yeah and, and it's really important, the catenary lights, like we're doing through Brick Market, where there's this uniform lighting. You know, that uniform lighting is really important to feel safe. Um, the, the point lighting, like um, that we're doing in downtown, the, the street lights, that's not as effective as, <coughs> as uniform lighting, like you'd see in places in Europe, in Paris, and, you know, the streets are well lit. You know, they're light string between buildings. Um, so that catenary light approach is, is what we'll be proposing to well light that, that area. And the stakeholders would all have to, <clears throat> you know, agree to attach because, you know, we'd want to attach to the parking garage, to our building, to the J.J. Newberry building, you know, and string them like we've done in Brick Market. And if you've gone downtown, if you've gone downtown to see the uniform lighting that is done between Tusc Tuscana, the first part of Brick Market at night, um, that would be a good example of what we'd be proposing for lighting down there. Because um, you're right, it, it, you, you don't, well, you don't want to set the stage for it to be a place that, you know, is dark and yeah, yeah. we just don't do that <coughs> anyhow. We is there space yeah. between Newberry's and the addition, the proposed addition? Because right now I'm seeing yeah. it, there's 10, ten feet. feet, right? Okay. Yeah, ten, we're staying 10 feet away from Newberry. Yep. Yeah. Any reflections or comments on the massing that we're seeing right now? <coughs> Can I speak about that, please? Uh, is it okay, Dan? Sure. Go ahead, John. Oh, okay. Um, the the height uh, doesn't seem to bother me because of the existing one, Market Street. Um, I would like to see it pulled back a bit from um, High Street. The, in other words, not have that height go uh, four stories right there on the street. Um, but uh, in general, um, I think the massing is appropriate for the lot. Um, by looking at the addition footprint and the renovation footprint, I have trouble whether or not they're going to add um, a story, for instance, to the former Jarvis building, which I believe is number three. I, I'm not sure. Um, I would hope not. I would hope that this addition be away from Congress Street. And uh, concerning Haven Court, I certainly, um, you know, uh, think that uh, Mr. McNabb has done a good job and will continue uh, to light Haven Court. And I would just remind everybody right now, is you can't even go down there now. It's, it's dangerous. It, uh, it's blocked off. And uh, so the, whatever he does is certainly going to be an improvement eventually. Um, but that, that's my idea on the massing um, at this point. Thank you, John. Dan? Thank you. <clears throat> I feel the same way on the massing when you look at it from the east side of High Street. But it really stands out and worries me when you get that uh, view of the massing from Congress Street. And again, that's it because that tiny little building is between, um, I guess where the bagel works is. Or where mm -hmm. the works are. Do you, so, I just want to point out that the, um, the, the section elevation of the massing, this is uh, an abstract diagram. Uh, it's in 2D. And the addition is way far back and back at the front buildings. So you would never, ever see that from real life because in perspective, the front buildings will block it. Unless you're up on the steeple. Unless you're up on top of the steeple, <laughs> right. In which case, you're going to have the backdrop of a five-story parking garage, parking garage entire, right directly behind yeah. it, which is about the most boring thing in town. <laughs> Martin? Um, yeah, I, I think the massing works, but I always look at these massing things and just think, well, it could be awful, it could be great. So uh, we'll see. Um, 
I think some real great opportunities to, to make some urban spaces that are currently languishing. I think Ladd Street is coming around to be a really beautiful little street mm -hmm. and hopefully uh, Haven Court will be similar. Um, I guess the big question is, are you, how, how much are you getting into the renovated footprint areas? Are you going to be gutting those buildings or are you going to be, because you're building on top of what you're talking about the old opera house. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this, this building carves out the non-historic add-on garbage behind the historic buildings up. to come in to get a new core because that's how we get rid of fire escapes. You know, the, the old buildings need an elevator and stair towers. So this adaptive reuse to those by bringing that in solves those problems for the front buildings and allows us to drop fire escapes and, mm -hmm. and bring those up to so the building inside. Sort of the skylights. Um, I mean, so, the, um, so that's why they have to come in, um, even uh -huh. though the new building will relieve the opera house because we want to read the coins in the corner, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to step back. Mm -hmm. And it will step back from the curved brow at the top. It'll be back there, though, but it's going to, you know, because it needs to connect. To those give buildings. it some breathing room but we're going to give it breathing room yeah okay but we need it we need to make it one building for uh two means of egress that's why we're staying 10 feet away from newberry so we can get an exit out the back uh, as one of our means for our separation that we need and then the other one would be the opera house would be the the branding of the main entrance for this whole building because it it's calling for that mm -hmm. it's it's this grand um it could be really fun um, did that answer your question? Sure. Or? I, I think it's, I, I'm all for density. I think LAD, uh, Commercial Alley, Haven Court have all that really intense density, mm -hmm. you know, path to relationship with the building. I go for it. I, I think that makes for a historic town. I, I love it. It'll clearly be a lot more relief than Pierce Block, which is, which is, you know, right across from it. That's. A lot more massive. It's a it's a wall that goes all the way up. This will have relief with the opera house and the historic buildings break up that that doesn't have that same linear four story wall mm. that Pierce Buck has. Reagan, did I hear you? Yep. <laughs> Sorry not to be there. Um, I have a quick I have a question. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you. I mean, these are a couple of the most beautiful buildings in our downtown. So I'm really excited to see how the restoration comes along and what you kind of, what you can find and design to really bring them back um, to their sort of original glory. Um, if you could go, so on 0 0.2, I just have a question question about this sort of the back buildings that um, I'm assuming that we are are just going to be demolished. So the top right photo on 0 0.2 shows all of those sort of one slash short two-story portions. So do you you own all the way up to that two and a half story gabled building on the right? This one. Yeah, we we own it that and we own that as well. Yeah, we own all the stuff that's yellow. So the all so, those add-ons, the yellowish colors that have been added on, it's the kitchen and the one story just glue ons to the the historic buildings on Congress Street would come down um, you know in favor of the new building coming in to to mirror up to the historic <clears throat> ones to provide stair towers and elevator yeah okay I'm just curious to know a little bit more of the history of those just when they were added on I mean just just for our due diligence of sure. understanding the site and how it grew. And Tracy, maybe you already have all this information. Um, yep, we so said, I, I would yeah. just like to know that and have that added to the history at some point so that um, we, and, and ask obviously for the, before any demolition, there'd be some proper documentation. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's okay. really, it's, you can tell inside it's even it's even new framing. You know, it says SPF regular two by six. It's just really garbage. The uh, that yellow uh, part, um, 
but we, we will be gladly to provide that documentation. But it's that material is all built on the site, the footprint of the destroyed hotel. I think this was in the alley between the hotel and yeah. the existing buildings. The hotel appears to be pretty much the entire asphalt surface of the parking lot. Okay. It was actually a U-shaped building. Karen, did you have? Yeah, I, I just want to say that I'm, I'm, this is a wonderful property, and I'm, I'm uh, very pleased to see how sensitive you are to the old buildings. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that, that what you're going to bring in is, is going to be equally wonderful. Um, I don't have a problem with the massing, especially given the location of it up against the parking garage. Um, yeah, I'm, the, the idea of getting rid of those hideous Fire escapes, it's just wonderful. <laughs> Can't wait. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other comments from the commission before we address the public? Anybody from the public wishing to speak on this oh, presentation? Anybody online? Okay, so oh. I think you've got pretty much support for the massing, a little bit of concern on the height on High Street, uh, you know, that, that yeah. first um, facade. Um, very excited about the renovation ideas. I really hope you can find some detail on the street level for all three of those buildings and, and bring them back. Um, and at this point, you would like a motion to continue until next month? Yes, please. So move. Thank you, David. Great. Second. Thank you. Thank you. It is second that, please. Thank you. Okay. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. And our Aye. people on Aye. the phone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. You're Great. welcome. Thank you, Tracy. Great. Thank you. All right. Do we need a break or we can do the last no, one? No, just do it. Okay. Board <laughs> <laughs> wow. session requested wow. by 445 <laughs> Marcy <laughs> Street. Owner for property located at 445 Marcy Street, wherein permission is requested to allow the construction of a new single family residence with attached garage. As per plans on file in the planning department, said property is shown on assessor map 101 as lot three and lies within the general residence <coughs> B and historic districts. Oh my gosh. And she's back. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, if you'd like to introduce yourselves. <laughs> and, uh, but before you do that, I'd, I'd like to just say first, I'm very pleased to see that you're starting at the beginning and starting with our first steps in terms of massing and not delving too, too much into the details just yet. We really do appreciate that. All right, Tracy, take okay. away. Tracy Kozak, Arco of Architects. I'm here with the applicants, Jim and Gail Sanders. Hello. Hi. All right. Um, well, this is a, a proposal to subdivide the parcel at 445 Marcy, which is famously known for the candy shop that's on it. Uh, it's been vacant aside from the tiny candy shop for, oh, I don't know, 50 years or so. I think I'll let Jim maybe tell the story, uh, the, his family's legacy of this whole neighborhood and how that candy shop came to be. To the, to, the, okay, well, to the best of my knowledge, um, the property was purchased by Ashley Jones back in the early 50s um, for, I believe, back taxes, from what I was told, anyways. And um, with, as far as the candy store itself was put on the building, put on, on, the, on the property by Mr. Jones back in the 50s for his, his hobbies or whatever. Um, I purchased it back in 1995 or 94, I believe, and it's been just, uh, I've kept it for whatever reason so I, that's pretty much the history of the of the property when i initially bought the property um there was, a, there was I, from the research that my attorney did i believe there were five property five buildings on that property over time and they've all you know gone away over over the time so um that's pretty much the history that i have of of that property and you'll see from the old maps that are in the packet that we'll go through that there used to be uh, various houses. It had the same density as the rest of the neighborhood originally. Uh, and as things uh, deteriorated and fell down, those just weren't rebuilt or maintained. Uh, okay, so this is the um, area maps. It's, uh, well, one of the main 
distinguishing features of this property and one that drives most of the design is that it's in a severe flood zone. Uh, Partridge Street, as many of you might know, <coughs> is one of the lowest points in the city. And when <coughs> we have the king tides and the flood tides, Partridge Street is underwater by a good foot or so, as is the um, southeast corner of this property. Uh, it's on a slope, so the northwest corner by Prey and Marcy is quite a bit higher, it's six feet higher. So we need to, um, we're, we need to locate th this new structure on the high ground. Uh, we are subject to the new and stricter floodplain construction requirements. Uh, we ha ha cannot have a solid basement anymore. The water has to flow through. And we want to make sure that this building is um, resilient. Going back to your discussions earlier this evening, uh, new construction in uh, a, t a tidal zone like this, we have to make sure it's, it's going to last. And also, we hope that this could be an opportunity to um, inspire other homes in the areas to find ways to uh, weather the storm. Uh, I think this neighborhood on the on the Portsmouth flood emergency plan, this neighborhood is the um, you know evacuate neighborhood, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, there are ways to build to uh, accommodate to, um, rising sea levels and climate change, and uh, we're going to do that. We hope to do that here. We are looking to make a. a super energy efficient building, uh, potentially passive house net zero, and one that can withstand the rising tides. Uh, th that is a, a driver of how we have oriented <coughs> the roof ridges so that we can hopefully uh, at least have it be able to accommodate solar um, at some point to reduce the impact on the environment. Uh, the whole reason we're having these challenges is environmental impact. 0.2 is the lot itself. Uh, looking in at the lot from the surrounding streets, it's oh, um, a third of an acre? Yes. A third of an acre. Yep. Mostly clear, six, a six foot slope. It is, um, so currently it, it's bordered on, by streets on three sides, Marcy Street, Prey Street, and Partridge, as I mentioned. We're looking to subdivide it parallel to Marcy Street, so the candy shop uh, would be on its own lot on, on Marcy Street. So the candy shop's not part of this application. Assuming we get this subdivision, that will be um, a different property. We're going <coughs> to uh, propose this new structure <coughs> on the parcel behind it, the newly created parcel behind it. Uh, page uh, 0 0.3 are the surrounding houses. It's really fun to look at the variety around here. And there's clearly been uh, some evolution in this neighborhood. Not only do we have a basically vacant third acre lot in the middle of the south end, which is mm -hmm. unusual, uh, it's surrounded by a variety of uh, buildings um, built at different times. Uh, starting on the top left, we have the two, um, two larger structures in the area. Right across the street on Prey Street is a kind of Queen Anne um, a fairly ornate two and a half story structure to the left of that is the one at the corner of Salter and Marcy, similar massing and, and size. Uh, as you turn down Prey Street, that building on the corner of Marcy and Prey has uh, th this very prominent gable top floor, third story, and, and the uh, kind of box, angled box bay that sticks out on the bottom. It has a little tower and some porches. And uh, the middle row of, of photos is a variety. You have um, some 18th century uh, clapboard homes on Prey Street as you get towards the water. Uh, Partridge Street, you begin to have kind of the Gable End New Englanders um, that are oriented a little differently. A lot of these buildings have porches. Some of them have roof decks. Uh, the, um, the gable end structures, you'll notice, all have the entrance to the side. Uh, on, the, on the bottom left, I had to throw in the fish market. <laughs> um, the fish market and the lobster pound, of course, are kind of the two anchors between um, this family's um, activities and presence. Uh, they have family members in, in, in the area. And uh, the forms on these fishing 
buildings are, I think, key to telling the story of their new, this will be their new home. They're going to live here. They're not going to sell it. And uh, their life is, of course, as you know, centered around uh, the fishing and lobster industry. And if you look at the forms of the buildings that are defining the lobster, the lobster shacks and the fishing buildings of Portsmouth, <coughs> they're, they're simple, but they're a little quirky. You have the, the asymmetrical salt box of the lobster pound. You have that kind of low wraparound porch on the fish market. You see some of that all over the neighborhood, but, uh, and the shingles, of course. Um, there's just a lot of different things that are going around uh, this huge site, and uh, in our design, we're gonna try to talk to some of those. The next page, uh, 0.4, are the historic, photo, well, the historic photo map on the upper left. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this is from 1877, and a lot had changed by then from the 1700s. I was not able to find anything legible that's earlier than 1877, but there are some remnants of stone foundations on the east, east northeast corner of the lot. I, I don't know that anything was ever built in that low area on Partridge Street. This photo on the upper right is Partridge Street, and that's from the 40s. Mm. Um, it floods now, but it, it's been flooding for a long time, and I, I don't know that anything was built in that corner. And in fact, I think people I used, don't to, think there ever was, used to go yeah. ice skating there in yep. the winter. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's just been a lot of evolution uh, on this property. Um, the next page, uh, the next couple pages are the footprint and the roof plan. And um, we've designed it so that we can have a, a drive-through passage from Prey Street to Partridge Street and orienting it so that we can take advantage of the sun angles and primarily um, wanting to open up this building kind of visually to the lawn in the back. Uh, they also, uh, the family owns the house next to it, so they kind of want this connection. Uh, to the back, which is why there's a porch on the back. Also, you don't see it from Marcy Street so much. And it's more solid and reserved facing the public streets, which is more in keeping with the uh, more austere feel of Marcy Street and some of the houses on Prey. Um, there is a parking garage. Uh, it faces Partridge Street, but it's set way back from Partridge Street. Uh, again, that's the, the flood zone. And that's A1 is the roof plan. There are two primary ridges, and it is angled because of the jog and the site. To the left, we need to provide access uh, through to Parcher Street. And the next page is uh, just kind of show you the plans for the reasoning of how that, that angle is accommodated. And a3 are the street sections, and again, these are two-dimensional, so they're a little bit abstract. You won't see this in real life, but it does give a, a baseline to measure the roof heights of the surrounding buildings. Um, basically, the houses to the north, like on Salter Street, are a little bigger, and the houses to the south, Holmes Court, Walden, are a little smaller, and this is kind of in the middle. And. Uh, and then the last page, we're starting to look a little bit more at form, but these are not detailed yet, and there's a lot to, uh, to go. But we do have the features that I mentioned on the surrounding buildings. Elevation one on the top left is kind of the front. Uh, it's a gable end uh, approach with a side entry porch. It has the box bay on the bottom, and then on the top, that prominent gable that we saw on the corner of Marcy and Prey Street. Um, there is a, uh, on the back, uh, facing the water side, we have a two-story uh, added on, kind of looks like a, a two-story sunroom addition. I think there are a few examples of that in Portsmouth. On the south end, thinking of the one on Hancock and Marcy. But we do have a little balcony up there. And um, so this is intended kind of as the captain's watch so that uh, Jim can watch his fleet. He's moving away from the water where he is now. And of course, um, there's still a very, very strong connection to the sea that this family has. And uh, being able to see the lobster pound and their family operations is, is really important. 
uh, to not lose that connection to the water visually. And so there's a little overlook um, on the back of the property there. Um, the, the west elevation, number two, has a lower eave line at one story, and this responds to the house directly across the street, which is one of the older houses in Portsmouth. It's a one-story cape, and they added a porch onto it at some point. So the porch is not original, but it's been there a long, long time, and it's one of the more, I guess, unique buildings on Marcy Street because it's so small. Uh, let's see, which one is that? That is on page zero point three, and it's the picture on the bottom right, 13 Marcy. Thir oh, it's mm -hmm. photo with the, number 13. With the garage sitting right in front of it. There is a garage sitting right in front of it. We're not going to do that, but um, just uh, the idea of it's keeping the scale uh, kind of low in human, uh, responding uh, directly across from that little low in human scaled house. That would also be the side that backs up to the little candy shop, yes. It is. Yep. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the this back of the property facing the east, the water side, there's a, there's a fence there now at the abutting property. Um, there would be a, a porch. That would be their backyard. Um, not a lot of visibility from the street, the way it's tucked back from Partridge. There'll be landscaping, probably some new fences. Uh, and that, well, oh, and there's another page. <laughs> I almost <laughs> forgot the colored pages. Um, yeah, this is just some 3D views to try to give you a sense of the house in its context. Uh, various angles, and the very last page are the bird's eye ax axonometrics and perspectives. This, uh, this is the city model, the 3D city model, showing how this building relates to those around it. It's not the smallest one. It's not the biggest one. Uh, as I mentioned, the larger buildings to the north, the Salter, the house, the Captain Titus Salter house, and the two Queen Anne's on Marcy Street. Um, there's a fairly large salt box built on Salter Street uh, 20 years ago. Um, so there's a variety. And uh, we've tried to break it up, the massing, to um, have the smaller pieces facing south towards the smaller houses and the larger chunk facing north. So. I'm going to let John or Reagan start off. Um, I'd like to start because of uh, comments about 454 Marcy Street directly across the street, which was the first home that I ever owned in 1972. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that garage, I saved it. <laughs> it was actually a foot higher than it is now, and it was leaning horribly. And that was my first experience with jacking and come-alongs and all of that stuff and taking uh, neither here nor there, but I just thought somebody might be interested in, in that. I owned that up until 76. Um, I, I guess um, my first question um, would be, I'll just give like three questions. The first question is, how does this water running through what would normally be a foundation, how does that work? I don't see anything that relates to that down here in Florida. Uh, <clears throat> when they bump into this situation, the house are up on posts and um, certainly don't hope that you're doing that. And then question number two is that front lot with the candy shop, that becomes more important um, so I'm wondering if that is meant to be developed uh, with another building, hopefully respecting more of the history of, of Marcy Street. Um, and with that in mind, uh, I just wanted to make the comment that, in my opinion, the Marcy Street side of this uh, building is, is the weakest side. Um, I understand why you brought it down um, to essentially pay homage to little 454 Marcy, but um, <laughs> it really does need a house in front of it. And is that is that the idea? And that's it for me. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, so the front parcel of the candy shop would be sold, presumably, and uh, it is. Um, developable by right. So 
the thought, it's expected that there's probably going to be a house built there. Um, there'd be a fence, a privacy fence. Uh, so you, you really want to get a clear view of this. This is the side of the house. It's not meant to be the front of the house. It's meant to look like the side of the house. It's going to be behind a fence in another house. The front of the house faces Prey Street. That's what I was wondering. Yep. Um, and, and, and just one other question. Uh, uh, why does the why does the driveway have to go from one street to the other? Um, well, Jim Jim plows his own driveway. <laughs> I don't it, know. it just it's, makes it's it, it makes sense yeah. to us to, to just to go from one street <clears throat> to the other rather than just to to make everything work is our, our reason for it, that. It actually allows us to have a smaller asphalt footprint, so you don't have that space to turn a car around and do the three-point turn. You just have a narrow pass through. The other important thing I should mention that influences that drive through is that this is an age in place house. This is where they want to live their days out. And um, when the time comes when they cannot do stairs and steps, it needs to be handicapped accessible. So this central entrance on the side facing Marcy would be level with grade. And you can see we're raising up the grade there. Um, but at, um, because we have to keep the floor above floodplain, if you look at where the house meets the street on Prey Street, it's, it's about three or four feet higher than the street. Um, and we have to do that uh, for flood reasons. That's not handicapped accessible. We don't want to have a big, giant ramp with railings on the front of the house. So the accessible entrance is on the side. That um, kind of mandates um, being able to have access through the side of the property. Reagan, did you have any questions? Yes, I do. Um, I There are a lot of things about this um, plan that I really appreciate. One of them being putting the, uh, the garage in the back and tucked away sort of out of sight, whereas uh, I see many new construction houses going up where the garage is right there front and center. Um, and so I, I really appreciate that part of it and the way that you have um, placed and sited the building on a lot. So I think that's very good. Um, and and the, the massing, it's, it's big, but I think that um, I'm willing to see it through with some of the developing of the design that you have. The only thing that really sticks out for me is that you have the, the facade that you have um, on Prey Street doesn't really have an, a, an entrance. It doesn't have a front door. Um, and that's something that you do see in all of the examples that you've showed, at, at least of the bigger houses. There are some houses that are there that are turned perpendicular to the street, so their, their entrances are sort of on the side and access through these little, little um, porch like this. But this is not one of those houses. And so I think what's really missing is a, is a nice formal front entrance, especially since you have it right on, right fronting the street. Um, so I, I, I'm curious as to why you've kind of hidden the front entrance. And I'd also like to encourage you to make a better um, front formal grand looking visible <laughs> entrance. Yep, abs absolutely. So that um, cue is taken off of, uh, if you look at page 03, the top left drawing, this is the um, house on the corner of Marcy and Salter. That has a gable end facing Marcy Street. The front door is under a little porch to the side of that gable. So this is the same idea where the front door to this proposed house is a little porch to the side. Um, the uh, drawing, I guess on the cover page, on the very cover page, there's a rendering on the top left that shows that corner porch. And we're doing a wraparound uh, steps uh, to accentuate that. There's also um, a little bit of a recessed uh, window, window seat almost uh, in that to create a feature element to draw the eye to that porch. And um, a lot of porches have a bench or some chairs. Uh, this is a place where people 
could sit on the front porch and watch people go by. It's, it's a spot for Amazon to leave their boxes. But, but mainly it's a welcoming feature. It's a symbol of welcome and to draw people into this porch to signify that it is the entrance. Um, there are some other examples. I guess I would. Oops, go, ahead. go ahead. Yeah, there's some other no, examples of side porches on page 0 0.3 as well on Partridge Street. Uh, picture number five, the middle one on the left is a gable end house uh, with a porch on the side. That's their entrance. And then um, the one I, I really love that's, is uh, the bottom. That's the one I was thinking of that yeah. really is just, it's turned, the house is turned perpendicular to the street. So of course yeah. its entrance is kind of hidden. You, know, you have to yeah. access it through the side. Yep. Um, sorry, I'll let you finish, but go ahead. Yeah, no, that that's all. We're just. Uh, um, I guess I would like to just see that that entrance. If you if you're determined to hide it on the corner there, I'd like to see it celebrated a bit more and just make it a an obvious front entrance rather than just sort of a hidden little corner. Okay. Yep. Other Thanks. comments or questions. <laughs> Dave? Uh, thank you. Um, I'm a little. I I, I know that you, uh, your 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 storyline is you're dodging the offset in the lot <clears throat> with the driveway, <clears throat> and that's what's causing you to angle the garage. But you have to admit that most of the buildings in the neighborhood are relatively rectilinear in their form. Not only the buildings themselves, but their appurtenances. Um, this this has because of the. I guess need for a drive through the property uh, has kicked this garage so that it has to to have it land where you want it to. It has to start someplace further to the right. Uh, as much as that bothers me, and I think is inappropriate, I, the, what the contortions that happened then to the rest of the back of the house seem uh, avoidable. Uh, and and I, the, the contortion of the roof line the, and the the sidewall. It seems like you're you're losing the whole orientation of the back of the building because you're following this garage, which makes me wonder if tipping the garage is such a good idea. Again, most of the buildings in this neighborhood, if if not all, all that I saw actually are relatively rectilinear. I mean, in as much as we aren't going to judge Mr. Wyckoff as to how well he arranged his garage to his property earlier, but but we assume he tried to pull it back into some sort of plane. Um, the other thing that uh, I, like Regan, I, I, I find myself wanting to see a front door, uh, wanting to see more. It, it, it's not uncommon, and, and, and I'm not saying that every house is built this way, but it's not uncommon during this period to devote one corner of the house. Uh, we just reviewed one uh, recently on Maplewood Avenue, where they, they, the, the door wasn't smack dab in the middle like a Georgian house, which just makes me comfortable, as you can imagine. But, but it was relatively obvious on the front of the house. It was in that quarter uh, sort of or third uh, program, but it still was on the front facade of the building. And it regularizes the idea of uh, the little kid with the Halloween bucket looking for the door to knock on. Uh, and I know that that's not exactly how architecture is taught, but it, it's, it's how people live. Anyway, my two comments, uh, they're both kind of jarring to me. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, we can definitely look at uh, making that uh, entrance uh, porch sequence more prominent. Um, I will say the crank on the roof, I, I think it does a lot for the building, and I would recommend we do it even if we didn't have to because what it allows us to do is to open up the building towards the back and get more light in. And, and it, it just does that subtle little angle to the roof where it begins to bring more light into the back where the living spaces are. Um, whereas you're, you're more closed and austere and, and private facing the public streets and more traditional uh, in the back where you're hidden from view and it's, it's the private space, you begin to get more light. There's more of a relationship to the water, which is key to this program as well. So it, it does a lot of wonderful things for the space inside the building and the way they use the yard. And I, I don't know that it's terribly visible um, from the street. It, it is visible when you look at it from above on a roof plan, but uh, yeah, it I seems have to work. 
I have a comment to make as well. I'm not Red sure. Hines. I probably don't need a mic. You can hear me. If I look at the, the north elevation, um, that elevation to me looks asymmetrical, even though it appears to be symmetrical. But if you look at, for instance, the vertical windows to the left and compare uh, the wall dimension from the corner to the window and compare that to the right side, you will see the difference. Um, so that bothers me a little bit. It's very, um, the illusion is there that it is symmetrical, but in fact it isn't. You're right. You're absolutely right. That should be symmetrical. We'll fix that. <laughs> Martin? Um, I think our question is, as a board, does this fit? Is this acceptable in our historic district? It's a new house. It is acceptable in the district. I, I like it. I, I'll change the quirks in it. I, I think I like the fact that it's not, uh, that it has its own set of rules, that it makes one, uh, it challenges some of uh, the surrounding architecture. I, I think that there's a lot of nice qualities about the fact that it's, it's a little crooked, it's a little, um, it, it's got some angles and things to it that you wouldn't typically see. Um, I think it's terrific. And as for the entrance, that doesn't bother me because Marcy Street has such a strong facade uh, that supports Marcy Street. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have a problem that the door is not like smack dab right in your face. Um, you know, because, because you, it does offer, it does offer itself to Marcy Street, and and so. I don't have a problem with some of the rules changing. This is a modern house in 2022. Um, you know, I think I think it's acceptable for the historic district. Other. Okay, Rich. Um, I also agree with Martin. I think it's, I think it fits well down there. I um, grew up in this neighborhood. My. Um, Grew up with your neighbor, the McLaughlin's there right next door, mm -hmm. um, and Mike <coughs> Sanders. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and I know, you know what I mean. I know, I grew up with her point of view. You know, living there and being so protective in the candy shop and the. Um, but I think it. I think it does fit. All right. So um, I just had two or three comments, and then we'll open it to the public. Um, so, I had some of the same reaction to the front facade, which is actually on Prey Street, which leads me to the, are you sure you want 445 to be your address, Marcy Street? Well, you, people are going to lose you. No, I, I don't. No, that will change <laughs> yeah, when the no. property is subdivided. Okay, right. Absolutely. Okay, just, just, just double check. Street, yeah. So I think, I, think the, I think the problem you're running into with the gable end on, on uh, right. Prey Street and, and the relation to the entrance is this uh, protruding bay window. Um, I think that if the facade were flat, the doorway on the porch side would read more prominently. This, to me, looks like a side facade. It's often you put, the, the, yes, there are bay windows in the, on the front, but to me this reads as a side facade versus a front facade, and I think, being, not being an architect, I think that's what's causing the problem. I'll just leave you with that thought. The other was, where did I put it? Um, uh, almost there. Aha. Uh -huh. The captain's walk section. This rectangular appurtenance that's kind of stuck on the end. Could you relook? at that a little bit I find that extremely awkward I love the idea of you being able to go out and you know and, and have your view but there's just something about that square cereal box that's stuck onto the end of what is otherwise a building with lots of non rectangular forms and now you've got this one odd form off of the edge so there might be something that you could think about 
with that one. Okay, we have somebody online in the public who wanted to speak, so we'll start there if Nick can okay. let that person in. So, Susan Mc McDougall, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. You're I think live. I've unmuted. Is that right? You're good. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I'm very, I wanted to start with, I'm very excited to know that Jim and Gail are planning to build a house in our neighborhood. Um, I live at 39 Prey Street, so I look out over um, a property his mother owns and this property, which has up to now been undeveloped. I completely understand that um, this, I have always understood that this was a developable um, lot, that it could be two lots. And I just wanted to um, bring up, I wanted to say that and to bring up some um, questions. Uh, I, I, one of your um, commissioners mentioned, uh, brought up the fact, some question about the address, and clearly the address is a Prey Street address. And all of the comps or all of the designers, architects, um, renderings and, and their, um, her, um, her, her um, comparisons have been with salt, with been either a big, the cotton house, I call it the cotton house on Salter, or, um, and I'm sure there's another name for it, the, and the two big Victorians that are um, one on Salter, one on Marcy. But this is not a Marcy Street property, it's a Prey Street property. And none of the um, height and relational um, uh, architectural um, comparisons have been done with any of the 1800s, um, including mine, houses that line Prey Street and Partridge Street. So I have some concerns about the scale of this um, of this property that is going to be directly across from an 1800s colonial, uh, sorry, center chimney, whatever, and and diagonally across from mine, um, and how that and how close it is to Prey Street. I have some concerns about the drive-through aspect of this, which wasn't really isn't really clear or defined. Um, I have to say. From Prey Street, I'm happy the garage is on Partridge Street. Um, but the, um, my major concern is that the renderings seem to have taken details from the Victorian at the corner of Marcy and Prey um, and used as a, quote, entrance um, detail what is really a side entrance for the Victorian at the corner of Marcy and Prey and not their front entrance. So um, I also know that we're going to see a tree go down. Of course, there's a very big, beautiful tree here that is shown in the, in the designs in some places, but it's not going to be there. So there's going to be some, um, this, this is going to be a very, very big building right in, in a place where there aren't really very big buildings. And then in, what will happen in front of it? Um, so I guess I would say that in terms of scale, if there was a scale issue, this belonged in the front of Mars on Marcy Street, not not in the back lot um, between one between the front lot and what's going on. So that my biggest issue is scale. And then the drive through, of course, as a resident of Prey, um, we now see Prey as a dead end and Partridge is a dead end. So I am concerned about the, what's gonna happen with these two lots. I know they're, they're if they have the frontage, 80 feet of frontage, um, that's okay. But I, I also, um, I, I have been, I have a lot that goes from Prey to Salter, but I've been told a number of times that I can't have two, um, I can't have two frontages, I can't have an entrance on Salter, and I can't have an entrance on Prey. So I'd like some clarification about that. Um, is it possible, really? Is it, 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 it planning-wise to have an entrance 
from prey, I mean, a actually drive through entrance from prey to part to partridge when it's not possible for me to have an entrance from prey to salter. Um, so those are a number of my issues. Uh, scale, the drive through. I do have a concern about the cereal box that will that I'll look at. Um, I don't I, design wise. It, I mean, this is just design wise. I don't think it fits. I do miss a front entrance. Every other house on Partridge and on Prey has a front door um, that's clear and defined. And this, I'm I'm sure you're following the. Um, the code for setbacks. So this happens to be fairly close to prey, which means that in its height, it will shed a phenomenal shadow. <laughs> I, a, and and I'm just wanting I'm just wanting the scale to be um, consistent with what's happening on partridge and prey because that's the location of this building. So that's it. Those are those are my major concerns. Um, but I am happy that um, that Gail and Jim want to build a house in the neighborhood. That's a good thing. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Anybody else from the public? Mark Minenberg. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so this is the first time that we're seeing the uh, the drawings, and I guess I had, oh, sorry, I'm Mark, I didn't introduce myself, I'm Mark Minenberg. Uh, my wife Nancy and I live in 437 Marcy, which is, I can see, has been used as uh, some inspiration for the design. Mm -hmm. uh, so we also will look directly at the at the house, and we, we also look directly at the, uh, the candy store. Um, so I, I guess I had two procedure. One's a procedural question, which is that um, is the after this meeting is there are there will there be additional opportunities to comment or is this really the one uh, the one opportunity given that none of us have really seen this before now? Uh, there will be additional opportunities for comment because I believe the applicant will come for at least another session. Okay. Yeah, we appreciate that. Um, and I just I had one question about. Um, what the square footage of the building is that's probably not any it's probably not an historic commission concern um but i'm just curious about how big this actually is do, do you have a sense for oh, we haven't finalized um, the numbers yet okay yes. I, the uh, reason I, i'm asking the question is that um, if you uh if, you know 437 marcy is only 2800 square feet it's a it's a pretty narrow and i'd say graceful uh 1890s queen anne and and so but and this building it you know strikes me as being uh probably twice as big and again i'm not suggesting that that means that uh the applicants uh are doing anything wrong but i think for those of us who who, who live in the neighborhood uh get, our house is usually viewed as the, the largest one and it's actually a pretty it's really not that big um and this is i think considerably larger um, and I think that's part of the concern you're hearing. The Prey Street neighbors are all on this call, essentially, or, or looking at it. And, and I think when you add to that the fact that, uh, I'll say in the case of 437, the Historic Commission has regulated this building so extraordinarily tightly uh, through the past four or five owners uh, to the point in which we can't, you know, we can't, uh, I had inspectors coming as I was trying to replace a picket fence uh and treated very roughly and we yet you know because this is a, a modern building it can really pretty much be whatever uh the applicant wants it to be and you know the concerns that the the commission are talking about now are you know where the door goes i think for us it's a it's a matter of something that's so gigantic and so seemingly out of scale that it's concerning all of us uh, again i'm not suggesting there are grounds for you not to approve it i don't i'm too new to the process to know that but I think it is alarming all of us who live in the neighborhood. And I think you should at least know that while you may view this as beautiful for all of us, we view it as uh, um, something that's completely out of scale. Again, I don't know, Jim, 
I'm, I, I'm sure he's, he sounds like a fine gentleman. None of this is personal. None of this is about trying to be unneighborly. But seeing it for the first time, it's a shock. And, and, and so all I want to just conclude with is just to say that, um, oh, wait, no, yeah, I'm oh, you're saying, oh, no, I'll talk, we can talk about that later. I'm being handed cards, but I think we can talk about it another time. The, the, just the point is that we're not trying to be unneighborly at all, and we all want to get along. Um, but it's a lot for us to absorb. If you look at the colonials on prey, as Susan said, um, they're of a totally different scale to this. And even our house, I'm going to venture, is probably half the size. And and we're, ours is viewed as sort of the you know the grand dom, and it's it's nowhere near this kind of building. So, okay, I'll I'll let it go there, um, unless someone has a question for me as a as a neighbor. Tracy, okay, I could just respond. Um, I absolutely appreciate it. it's it's always a shock to go from a third acre vacancy to a building. Um, there's nothing that will make that less abrupt. Um, to have something well, a, a smaller building something. would. Sorry to sorry well, to interrupt, but um, but if you look at sheet A three, uh, it it simply dimensions this building compared to what's around it, and as I said before, it's not the largest building and it's not the smallest building. Um, it's we think it, it fits, especially because of its uh, distance from the houses around it, uh, and and it doesn't dominate. Also, the last page has it in three dimensions, which might be easier to uh, compare um, the context, if you look at sheet A6 as well. Yeah, y yeah. again, it, it, it appears to be about twice the width of 437. So I, I'm guessing that it's probably, you know, 5,000 square feet at least. And, you know, it, it'll, be, it'll be twice the size of any. It's, it, I look at it as pretty much the size of, uh, uh, you know, Sal's, we, um, our neighbor's house, the other Victorian and ours put together. But which is again, it may be fine and legal, but it's why we're so shocked. So, I'll, I'll stop talking because you don't want to. I uh, I used to <laughs> back in the day. I used to practice land use and environmental law, so um, I get a little on my high horse. But thank you. Thank you. Oh, for your I'm being asked. One, you know, actually, I'm being asked about how the water displacement will work. That's one last thing is that it, that as as this if if we have flooding, will that displacement of water essentially uh, push the water across Prey Street and, uh, you know, it created an effect of, uh, uh, you know, diverting water back on the rest of the properties. I'll, 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 uh, I'll if you, someone wants to mute me, I'm happy to be muted at this point. So I don't want to be difficult. Here we go. Um, there's probably a different venue to talk about water management on the site rather than HCC, but we're happy to have those conversations with the civil engineer and whatnot. Yeah, it really doesn't fall under our purview, yeah. but Mark, we appreciate you raising the concern. Thank Great. you. We appreciate the commission as well. Again, we're all neighbors and citizens of the same town, so um, none of this is meant in, in a spirit of other than cooperation and goodwill. Very good. We live thank here. you. But we live here, as my wife just said. <laughs> so, I mean, we thank, live here. Thank you. Yeah, it's not like we... Anybody else? Okay, uh, we have nobody else in Zoom and nobody else in the room, so I'm closing the public comment session. And unless there are further comments, I think we could move to continue for next month. Move to continue. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 John and Reagan? Aye. Aye. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll look forward Thank to you. seeing you again. And a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Anybody in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you very much. Aye. Thank you.